father's hug. Did he love her? What was considered love? If having dominion over her was considered as love, then he could reply to this child that he loved her. He understood that dominion and desire did not equate to love, though, so his mind suddenly drew blank at this question. Andres noticed his hesitation and felt disappointed with him. He even had to hesitate at this question. Since you're still thinking about it until now, I believe you don't really love my mommy. Andres briefly paused, his eyes radiating apathy. If you don't love her, then why are you still clinging on to my mommy? You have an elder brother. Stefan spouted all of a sudden. Andres was dumbfounded, and after a while, affirmed, I know. Why did he suddenly mention that child? He looked at him with a bit of confusion, but did not comment further. A loving smile appeared faintly on the man's face at the mention of his other child. He is called Sam Lewis. He's as tall as you. If he is to stand beside you, even I will be incapable of telling you two apart. Immediately, a somewhat absent-minded look appeared in his eyes. He knew he had an elder brother, and in fact, did not mind that relation. He was just subconsciously opposed to having him. However, when this man brought up about him, he became more curious of that brother of his. Perhaps it's telepathy between brothers. He used to tell me about seeing a younger brother in his dreams. Stefan glanced at him and smiled. I initially treated it as a child's babbling, but now I think that it's pretty incredible. I can't help but admire the creator's miraculous powers. Hearing this, Andres had to agree that it was pretty incredible, as his eyes showed a stunned glint. He... he dreams of me? Yes. Stefan simply added, I want to give him a complete family. The same goes for you. Andres, are you willing to have a family like that? His thin lips opened and closed when the man said his nickname aloud. For a split second, an unfamiliar feeling surged up in his chest, and unaware of it, crept into his heart. A complete family. A family with a daddy, a mommy and maybe a brother that cared for him. This man standing in front of him was gently asking for his opinion. He asked him if he was willing to have a family like that. Of course he was willing. Oh. He desperately yearned for that kind of family in his heart. However, when he opened his mouth to speak, he replied otherwise. I'm unwilling. The man's expression remained the same. Obviously, he was not surprised by his reply, let alone having this six-year-old child accept his identity as his father. Even he took some time to let it sink in when he found out that he had another six-year-old child. What was more, given the cleverness and independent thinking of the child before him from their few talks, it was to be expected that his every word, which was centered on protecting his mother, would be able to corner and pressure him regarding his intentions to her. Although he was standing in front of him, he was not scared or embarrassed at all. He was calm and decisive. He was being absolutely direct for his mommy's happiness. From what he spoke, Stefan could tell that he had a logical mind. His negotiation skills were similar to him as well. In a few words, he concluded that, despite his tender age, he was a formidable character. He knew this from that statement. Stefan, let me tell you this. My mommy is a treasure to me. If you want to care for her, you should be legitimate. For the child, the first condition for his happiness was his mommy's happiness. If one day I tell you that I love your mommy and I want to make her my only wife, Andres coolly answered, It's not enough that you like my mommy. She has to like you too. Stefan's lips twitched a little as he was slightly overcome by the child's tyranny and haughtiness. The boy was indeed his son. Every word and every action of his had a bearing of a reigning lord. Andres was charmingly smiling. This elegant smile was fitting for a little gentleman. Stefan, you'd better get this right. You may think that your love is a blessing for women, but that's for other women 
and not relevant to my mommy. To my mother, this is a basic foundation in a relationship. She is pretty, kind, and gentle. Plus, she has me, her son, to love her. If you want to be with my mommy, love has to go both ways. You understand? Oh, does that mean that I still have a chance? The man asked. The boy gave him a sidelong glance and snorted. Yes, but it depends on your performance. Then, for now... The man suddenly stretched out his arms and asked with tenderness while gazing gently at the small, exquisite face before him. Can I hug you? Fatherly indulgence he felt in his mellow, baritone voice. Andre's heart jumped suddenly, and his heart rate seemingly slowed down as his vibrant doe eyes widened at those words. Dong, dong. Seeing the boy's hesitation, the man hummed to prompt him for a reply. The little lad hesitantly stuck out his tongue to wet his dry lip flaps. He looked at his father's comfortable-looking broad chest, and his eyes revealed a tinge of desire. No child could resist a father's warm hug. It was the same for Andres. He felt something bittersweet stinging his eyes. He was actually a little elated and looked forward to a hug from his father inside. When he was much younger, he watched other children of his age run to their father's arms after school. Those scenes with those mighty-looking arms hugging the children somehow always stung his eyes. His mommy's hug had always been gentle, but it was without any strength. He was not entirely comfortable when she hugged him. If his daddy hugged him, it would be such a blessing, right? With his father's strong arms, warm and broad chest, and steady heartbeat, the little boy felt that he would be more comfortable and secure. It was also as if he could reach for the sky if he were to sit on the man's shoulders. That kind of feeling should be called happiness, right? Unknowingly, the little lad could not help but stretch out his hand with a little anticipation. An irresistible charm seemed to have been cast on him as his body yearned for the man's chest. Stefan's eyes lit up and caught hold of his small little hand. The little hand should be pink and soft, yet it felt cool and even carried a sickly wand right now. Despite the palm's diminutive size, the five fingers were long and smooth. Clean nails, prominent knuckles, and beautifully shaped hands were just like his. The boy's palm felt soft to the touch, and the man easily secured his entire hand in his big palm. The man realized that he liked his son very much. The child was intelligent beyond his age, kind and understanding, as well as overly mature, which made the man eat for him. Andres shrank away from him instantly, looking awkward. The boy flushed deep red as he gazed up at his father. He appeared fearful of the man, misunderstanding, and emphasized, I only let you hold me for the sake of my mother. His father was startled for a moment, before smiling, replying, All right. Don't assume that I've already accepted you just because I let you hug me. You still have to prove yourself. The little lad was still maintaining his stance, though his face was tinting with more red from shyness. Episode 142 Telepathy Between the Twins Don't assume that I've already accepted you just because I let you hug me. You st still have to prove yourself. The little lad was in his stance. The face was tinting with more red from shyness. His face might be looking awkward, yet deep down, he was much looking forward to this hug. Through his visage, it still played along with him by merely concurring. Oh. Only this time, you can hold me. This one time when the man nodded one more time, that with a pout, he gingerly drew it a step closer. One step, and then another. 
This went on until his father gained athletic arms, recrossed his armpits, and powerfully embraced him. This little lad's face flushed skull child was too skinny. He wondered if the child had a rare case of malabsorption or was suffering from nutritional imbalance. Possibly, that stupid woman did not nourish adequately. Children of his age are still developing and should eat more. And in sonar and his body could not take in all the nutrients from the abundant, nutritious his mother was feeding him. In his arms, the little guy was as light as a fluffy rice ball. Andres dipped his head shyly to guide his blushing face from the man, while Stefan lowered his head to ponderously gaze at him. What was Andres feeling? It was an unfamiliar sense of fatherly love. He used to yearn for a father's love. One with strong arms that could easily hold up the sky, and with a warm, sturdy chest that could thaw the cold winter snow. Carefully laying his head on his father's chest, he was able to hear the strong and powerful heartbeat of his father. His nose stung all of a sudden, and a thin, rosy film spread across his cheeks. Without realizing it, the thick, curly eyelashes framing his eyes were tainted with wetness. It felt so warm. Pound, pound, pound. The heart sounded like a drum beating. Somehow, as he sat listening to the strong rhythmic thumps, an inexplicable sense of safety welled up from within. He fell asleep unknowingly. Monica returned with the bun milk. The little lad already sound asleep in his father's embrace. She opened the door to the scene. The man who was sitting beside the bed was holding the boy, whose eyes tightly shut in his arms. Under the illumination of the setting sun, the little lad's was waxed cheeks. The boy's eyes with to disturb the sleeping. Prince the footstep and glanced up. She understood and turned. Hinge, Principal. Sound asleep now. Ready late. You should be your way. You're welcome. The agent grinned and stole another look at the sleeping boy in his father's arms. Uh, this little lad looks cuter when he's asleep. He has a tame and demure look, which is expected from a six year old. He sighed and turned to her. I won't stay around then. I'll get going now. See you soon. Oh, goodbye, Principal. The room reverted to its silence after she had closed the door. And the silence was full of peacefulness. Monica placed the goods she had purchased on the nightstand and sat down at the side. For a moment, both of them remained silent. At first, when the man carried the child affectionately... Some emotion throbbed in her heart. However, now, she could not help but be a little worried. Would this man have a change of mind after seeing the child? Was he going to acknowledge the child and take him back to the Lewises? Although this man acquiesced to leaving the child by her side, he had never stated that he would give up on his child's custody rights. Carrying on the line was usually heavily emphasized among the rich. This child was also Ultimately, of his bloodline. Even if he agreed not to bring him back, would the Lewis family consent to this? Perhaps not. He a little distressed. She was not careful enough. She should have hidden the child well. Now that his identity was out in the open, she was very much in a passive situation. Stefan carried the little boy carefully. He continued to have his head lowered as he was engrossed in observing his supple face for the longest time. She was not just surprised by this. In fact, she was very shocked. From what she had gathered based on the rumors circulating, she had this impression of the man being tyrannical toward others. First met, 
He appeared in the dimly lit room with an unapproachable aura. Every movement of his brooked no interference. He seemed like a ruler standing above all, not tolerating defiance or disobedience from anyone. No matter how frightened she was, the man gave her no consideration. They met again six years later, and he was still his haughty self. Of course, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, after all. He was born a crown prince, living his life in luxury and splendor. He was always aggressive and arrogant, to the point of being insufferable. Right now, however, the man in front of her was not his obnoxious self, and contrary to her expectation, he was, in fact, very patient. What was more surprising to her was the way he held the child. He appropriately held him and did not show any signs of clumsiness and awkwardness. He did it properly to the extent where Andres could sleep soundly in his arms. She frequently carries Sam to sleep like this? He must be very experienced. Still, with his position, he had probably hired a group of nannies to take care of the child most of the time, right? She surveyed him for a long, long time. Dolly. Aren't you tired? I want to carry him a little longer. Incredible. Your arms ache? There's more sure that would poke him back to sleep. He woke up. Palpitated. An aching surge of heat seemed to flow into and kindle in her chest. Why did he have constant nightmares? He furrowed his brows as he was puzzled by that too. He dreamed of someone bullying his younger brother. She was stunned. This... What was the dream? I don't know. He slightly narrowed his eyes. Perhaps this telepathy between the twins. Is there really something so magical like telepathy? She was amazed by this. Episode 143. The Past. As soon as she said this, footsteps were heard from beyond the door. They seized right outside the hospital ward. Knock, knock, knock. There was a series of knocks on the door. Monica knitted her brows and walked towards the door to open it. Matthew stood outside with a weathered and sullen face. For some reason, he seemed to have aged a lot within a night. Shocked, she looked past his shoulders but did not catch the presence of Rosie or another. He noticed her guardedness and immediately said, There is no one else. I came alone. Dad. She looked up at him with mixed feelings. She opened her mouth to speak several times, but even after a while, she was still unable to voice out anything. Hopelessness, heartache, regret, decisiveness. These feelings were written all over her face, and they did not escape his eyes. He owed this child of his too much. He came to explain everything clearly this time. Monica, let me take a look at Andres. I also need to talk to you about something. Her lips curled upward. Dad, the doctor said that Andres is already fine. He probably just had a relapse. He's now asleep. Her father sighed and spoke unhurriedly. Don't worry. I'll just take a look. Just one look, and I'll leave. She nodded and pushed the door slightly ajar. He entered the room 
and made his way to the bed, seemingly not noticing Stefan standing at the side. The man had carefully carried Andres to bed and covered him up with a blanket. The little boy was, right now, peaceful and docile in his deep sleep. Matthew sat beside the bed and gazed at his fragile appearance. He wanted to reach his hand out to caress him, but midway through, he retracted his hand back in remorse. He broke down in pain. I don't deserve to be called Grandpa. Dad! He suddenly stood up, moved to the balcony, and beckoned her over with his hand for a private talk. She immediately stepped onto the balcony and closed the glass door behind her. The father and daughter stared at each other for the longest time. The stifling silence ended when he abruptly broke down into tears. You've suffered so much all these years. You down terribly for failing to protect you. Her eyes turned watery and reddened at his words. No one could understand the complexity of the emotions she was currently experiencing. All these years, he had always treated her like his own, and although Rosie and Emma had never accepted her, he had faithfully carried out his duty as a father by providing her with all her needs. He had done this despite them not being related by blood. In the past, for over a decade, as Matthew lost his fertility after coming down with an illness, Rosie pestered him for a son. The two proceeded to visit the welfare center to adopt one. He had first seen her inside a room back then. He stood by the window and spotted the then nine-year-old Monica, cuddling her shivering body and huddling in a corner of the room. Her eyes were empty and lifeless. She looked very depressed. Observing her closely, there were lacerations in green and purple all over her body, and she appeared to have a weak mental constitution. For some reason, he felt a throbbing pain in his chest. Regardless of her facial features or demeanor, this girl was remarkably beautiful and sweet. She seemed to be a pretty clever child, and her clear-cut brows indicated spiritedness. However, for reasons unknown, she shut herself in the empty room while other children were out playing. She hugged her knees and shivered intensely in fright. She was probably under the other children's constant bullying, was she not? Rosie prompted him to leave, but he indicated to their accompanying teacher that he wanted to meet this poor child instead. The teacher walking behind them wore an awkward expression. Back then, Matthew, who was quite successful in his business, had quite a prestige in the area. She advised him, with good intentions, Mr. Thames, do you have your eyes set on this girl? No one in the welfare center likes her, and she seems a little statistic. I'm afraid that she might be a bit mentally challenged. She never likes to talk, and has this splendid look all the time. Looking at her bring one's spirit down. Plus, she once stole from another girl. So everyone ostracizes her. She stole something? Rosie wrinkled her brows and interrupted right away. No, we can't accept someone who steals. How can she have such behavior? Matthew, don't waste any more time on her. Let's go and look at another child. Shut up. He bellowed at her. He turned to the teacher with much dissatisfaction. Man's nature at birth is good. The child is still young and has yet to develop a sense of what's right and wrong. Even if she has erred once, as a teacher, shouldn't you lead her on the right path? Instead, look, this child is bullied to this extent, and you say that she's mentally challenged. How could she not be? The children around her bully her, and the teachers don't care about her. What can a young child like her do? The teacher was embarrassed by his moral condemnation. She hurriedly brought Monica out. She stood before him, and gazed up at the man's extremely amiable face. Huddling herself into a corner in shock, her lips trembled open. I... I'm no thief. I'm really not one. Don't arrest me, please. He felt a sudden and inexplicable ache in his heart. Although he was clear that he and this child had no blood relations at all, when he saw her fragility, his heart ached so terribly it was suffocating. 
Hence, even when his wife repeatedly opposed, he still decided to adopt her. Thinking back about it, Monica was still grateful to him. Having such a miserable childhood, if it were not for his redemption, which gave her a new lease on life, she would not even know how she would turn out to be. Regardless of how Rosie and Emma treated her toward him, she was only ever thankful. Present. After staying silent for a long time, he eventually spoke. I decided to divorce her. Tomorrow we are going to file for divorce. The her he had mentioned was, of course, referring to Rosie. Hearing this, she thought that it was quite unexpected. Divorce? Dad is going to divorce Rosie? She tried to evade the subject. He stood still to regard her. Faltering for a while, she eventually spoke her mind. Dad, I support your decision. It's a wise decision to divorce her. I know. I know that for marriage, one can only encourage mediation and not separation. She's too greedy. If you continue to be with her, you'll only be implicated by her. Dad, why are you tiring yourself this much? It doesn't matter whether I'm tired or not, as I'm already getting on in years. A man of his age would have put up with everything possible by now. He was already having one foot in the grave. Getting a divorce at this time would not be pleasant news, and people would expectedly gossip about this. Still, ultimately, he could not bear to compromise this daughter of his. As for you, I feel the most guilt toward you. I'm now only aware that the incident six years ago was forced upon you by her, and I'm truly a good-for-nothing. He stomped on his foot as he said this and threw himself a tight slap. She stopped him immediately and helplessly said, Things are already in the past. They're not worth mentioning now. Episode 144, Divorce Matthew spoke with a heavy voice. Things may be in the past, but I'm unable to forgive or forget. He drew a handkerchief from his chest pocket and revealed a bank card neatly wrapped within. Looking at her, he said, There's about five million inside. Thing into this bank card. Thereafter, he also deposited his salary from work into this bank card regularly. Although it was nothing much, it was a token of his regard. He saved this money to prepare for Monica's dowry when she married off in the future. He was already getting on in age. He was not very capable and not as enthusiastic as his younger self. He received a monthly salary of about $3,000, excluding daily expenses. He scrimped and lived off his salary. He had not touched a penny in the card in these past few years. He had always kept this card securely stored away. Rosie was unaware of the presence of this huge amount of money. This was to prevent her from coveting it. Even Monica assumed that all the money had been used to pay off the debts back then. Earlier on, when Emma got into a mishap, he visited his adopted daughter to get a chance to discuss this with her. He figured that since his daughter was in trouble, he had no choice but to talk to Monica. He thought that she would definitely agree to withdraw a few $10,000 from the bank account for this urgent matter. After all, she was good-natured and considerate. Who knew that he would be enlightened of the truth six years ago? His world turned into complete chaos, and at that moment, he was unable to accept the truth. Now, determined to divorce Rosie, he thought that this card should be returned to its rightful owner. Although house prices in the capital are running high with each passing day, the balance in this card is enough to buy a decent apartment. I may have divorced that woman but our father-daughter relationship is still intact. In the future, when you are free, come join me for a meal with Andres. There's enough for me. 
Dad, this money... He stated, This is yours. I couldn't tell you earlier in fear of that woman catching wind, but... I'm saving it for you. And now I'm giving it to its original owner. You are surely in dire financial straits with Andres around. And because he's currently confined in the hospital, a lot of money definitely needs to be spent. This should be enough for the emergency. Thanks, Dad. She received the bank card from him and grinned. Dad, now that you're divorcing her, and since you also said that our relationship is still intact, move in with us. I'll take care of you and Andres. He hesitated, but eventually rejected. This isn't a very good idea. Don't you know that woman's character? She's greedy for riches and used to being wasteful. If I were to stay with you, she would surely run over to make a scene. And I'm afraid that you and Andres can't live life peacefully then. Now that you are doing well, you can't let her implicate you again. He spoke these earnest words as he truly had this mother-son pair's best interests at heart. After all, based on Rosie's character, she would not take things lying down. One could infer that he was already extremely tired of this failed marriage, with him labeling Rosie as that woman. He had done everything he could to pay off all of Emma's hospital bills. He had also done his best for this daughter of his, advising her in every possible way. At present, she was succumbing to such plight, and although distressed, he could only let her go. Monica told him, What's there to be afraid of? Dad, please just don't be deceived by them again. I feel relieved that you've seen their true colors. In the future, let me provide for your old age. Don't tell me that I have to watch you live your life with no one to rely on. You've raised me till this age. I'll definitely repay your kindness. Clearly, he was the one who owed her so much. Matthew was moved, yet annoyed. His lips quivered as he constantly nodded. She might be adopted. She was more filial than his biological daughter. He might have given birth to a heartless and good-for-nothing Emma. But he was relieved to have found a caring daughter like Monica. This time, he did not reject her offer and simply replied, I'll talk about this later. That woman will definitely not take this lying down after I divorce her. She'll certainly make a fuss about dividing the family's assets and try to implicate you. Dividing the family's assets? She said. Do you still have to share your property with that woman? I'll certainly not. Luckily, I wasn't befuddled back then. When I bought that apartment, I registered it under your name. Even though we are divorcing, I won't let her benefit from me. This is an evil she's brought on herself, so she should bear its consequences. I, Matthew, have never treated her unfairly. I don't feel ashamed, even though we're divorcing. Only the possibility of troubling you. She was a little bewildered. That four-room condominium that their family had bought back then from resale was actually registered under her name. When the father-daughter pair came back indoors, for reasons unknown, this ward was packed with nurses. Matthew saw the handsome man by the bed and was instantly confused. This is... He seemed to have met him before. At her father's mention, she took a look at Stefan and said a little sheepishly, this is my university professor, Mr. Lewis. He's this young? Father was quite flabbergasted. The man before his eyes was clearly only 27 or 28. He appeared to be extremely handsome and youthful. He truly was a fine specimen of a man. When he raised his face, his perfectly carved facial features and beautiful appearance were akin to a royalty standing above the masses. With just one look, one could feel his intimidating aura. He was clearly still young, yet he came across as mature and reserved, and each movement of his exuded elegance. In front of him, one would have a feeling of inferiority. Even Matthew could not help but feel a little ill at ease. So you are Monica's university professor. Nice to meet you. You look uh, very young. Stefan coordinated with her and nodded, but he seemed to possess a cold personality, and he did not say anything much. 
Eh, what's the matter? She was surprised at the presence of a few nurses in the ward. We're changing rooms. Stefan replied straightforwardly. She then recalled that the hospital's director, whom she had previously met, they seemed to have mentioned something about them being moved into a deluxe room. In any case, why were there so many nurses gathered in this ward? She could only see these nurses crowding at the door of the ward and surveying Stefan from head to toe with either astonishment or adoration. At first, when the head of inpatient department informed the nurses that the young patient in this ward was to be moved to a deluxe room, a few of them brought over a hospital bed to facilitate the transfer. However, upon entering the ward, these nurses spotted a handsome man sitting by the bed, gently caressing the child's face. That side profile, which was as perfect as the gods, instantly stole everyone's heart. Oh my god, the family of a patient in Ward 702 is so good looking! How good looking is he? He's better looking than a celebrity! He instantly defeated Martin Lee in the looks department. Also, he has a very gentlemanly aura. He's definitely well off. Episode 145 What have I taught you so far? Thus, those nurses who had some spare time came the moment they caught wind of this, and within a short time, they were all gathered in the ward. Seeing Stefan, all of them were stunned. Oh my god, he's really tall and handsome. He should at least be 1.9 meters in height. I only reach up to his shoulders. Oh my god. I wonder if he has a girlfriend. Oh, is that child his son? They look so alike. Thus, the nurses looked back and forth between Stefan and Andres. Some were suspicious, some were shocked, some were disappointed, and some were desolate. Is he already married? Oh my god, his child must already be six years old. Huh, hot chance of that happening. The child was chattering in whispers. Although they were speaking softly, they still woke up the little boy, who was previously sleeping soundly in the bed. Andre's brows slightly furrowed, and he smacked his lips. He seemed to have really been interrupted from his sleep as he kicked his blanket in frustration. Stefan's face was immediately covered in thick snow upon noticing that the child had been disturbed. Monica saw this and felt a little sorry for him. She approached the nurses at the entrance and said, Excuse me, please lower your voice. Don't crowd around the ward as it is disturbing the child's sleep. An intern nurse realized that she was blocking her way and said in irritation, as she shoved her aside, Oh my, it's almost dawn. There'll be a nurse on duty shortly to check his blood pressure. Also, aren't you changing rooms? Isn't it just the right time for him to wake up? Precisely. Some parents now simply love their child too much. A trace of anger appeared on Monica's face. Is this how you do your work? What do you mean? The intern refuted her inappropriately. She was most likely a fresh graduate. Someone beside her immediately tugged at her sleeve. Enough! Stop it! We were a little loud just then. Huh? Aren't you that child's mother? The intern suddenly gossiped. What's this mister's relationship with you? You just heard this woman say that this man is her university professor. And I recently saw this news about a university professor providing for a student. Someone lowered her voice and put in her two cents worth. Could it be that this child is there illegitimate? Are you done? Monica was enraged by humiliation. Do you have to pry into a relationship? As soon as she asked this, their eyes subsequently widened and shocked while they looked past her shoulders. She, who was late to catch on, turned around and found him standing behind her, scanning the crowd at the door once with annoyance. His voice was as cold as frost when he said, Scram. Hostility could clearly be detected in his voice. One word was enough to make the crowd instantly scatter. It was a clean job. The word regained its lost peacefulness. She heaved a sigh of relief and felt somewhat speechless at this. The procedure to move to another ward was carried out quickly. A little while later, the inpatient departments had, 
along with two nurses, pulled over a bed into the ward and transferred the little boy over. Matthew held the bed and left with the department head. He reminded Stefan before he left, It's already morning, Mr. Lewis. I'm very thankful that you came to visit Andres. You haven't rested for an entire night. Please let Monica accompany you downstairs. Stefan looked him in the eye with a distant gaze. Matthew was frightened by his look. After a short exchange of pleasantries, he left the ward in a hurry. His adopted daughter told him that that man was her university professor. On the surface, he buttered him up a little, but he was certainly not born yesterday. He accepted his daughter's explanation when she introduced the man as a professor from the university, but he was not a naive three-year-old kid. He knew that Monica had intentionally hidden the truth from him. Although he had no clue who the man was, he could largely deduce his identity when he realized how much Andres resembled him. Man should be that mysterious employer from six years ago. He just did not want to embarrass his daughter, so he did not pursue the matter further. Matthew accompanied his grandson as the nurses wheeled his bed up to a special care unit on the 15th floor. He reminded his daughter to go home and catch some rest first before returning to the hospital to take over his shift. She thought for a while before nodding in agreement. She would need to go back to pack some clothes for Andres anyway. At the elevator entrance, she told the man, Stefan, it's late. You should go home. A thin veil of rage covered his face. He asked with a raised eyebrow, Are you chasing me away? I don't want you to get tired from lack of sleep. His face instantly relaxed, and he proceeded to ask with a teasing look, Oh, are you concerned about me? It's up to you to decide what you want to think. Annoyed, she angrily told him off. Don't blame me when you don't have the energy to work. He smiled. With one hand in his pants pocket, he leaned forward and panted to her ear. I'm always full of energy. You should know that since you already had a taste of it, hadn't you? He was obviously referring to their makeout session. She bit her lower lip at his words, her cheeks reddening. Exasperated, she shot him a dark look. Nonsense! I don't know what you're talking about. Ding! The elevator doors parted open. Just as she stepped into it, she was pushed into a corner, and her body hit the cold and hard surface of the elevator. Her eyes widened in shock. Before she could regain her composure, the man's tall and broad frame had her pinned to the wall. He had carefully orchestrated this move, ensuring that the corner he had pushed her into was outside the viewing zone of the surveillance camera. The elevator door closed, and there was just two of them inside the cramped space. She looked up at him, horrified, as he bowed his head and clasped her chin tightly with his hand. His narrowed, slanted eyes stared deeply and heavily into hers. His eyes gleamed evilly at her helpless eyes. He drew near her face and said in a husky voice, Little liar, you're interested in dude. What? What do you want? She hastily turned her face away, only to find him tugging her chin in place to force her gaze back on him. Oh, you seem demure and innocent, but you can be such a smooth liar when you want. She was stunned for a moment as her face flushed unnaturally. She was forced to tell a lie in the first place. How could she possibly tell the truth to her father? This would undoubtedly rip open his scarring wound if she were to come clean with him. Matthew had been blaming himself for the contract she had signed six years ago. He was angry that his beloved daughter had to become a surrogate mother because of his financial incapability. If she were to tell the truth, her father would surely be incredibly embarrassed. As for him, he had casually followed her to the hospital without prepping her at all. How could he, therefore, turn around and blame her now? She avoided his gaze and looked upset with her pouting lips added a childlike charm to her in the man's eyes. Professor? Huh? He let out another wicked laugh with his long and slender fingers pinching her cheeks and his thumb pressing heavily on her lower lip flap. He asked in a lazy tone, Little thing, tell me, what have I taught you so far?
Episode 147. Bump into. Little thing, tell me, what have I taught you so far? As he spoke these words, he brashly reached out to claw the feel of her breath while he bowed his head to bite her lower lip. The tip of his tongue ran over her lip flap as he sniggered lewdly. You mean this? It was clear that he had not taught her anything useful, except for abominable matters. She let out a scream and forcefully pushed him away. Anger welled up in her eyes. What are you doing? We are inside an elevator, and it can stop for passengers at any time. How can he not know how to restrain his perverted behavior here? The more deeply she thought of it, the more embarrassed and annoyed she felt. Just then, his handphone rang. She heaved a sigh of relief, thinking that the man would pick up the call and the disaster would be averted. Unfortunately, it seemed that he did not intend to let her go, as he merely ignored the loud ringtone and continued to advance on her. His slender fingers gently stroked her face as he studiously examined it. With a low growl, he lamented, Her bewitching face. Her pure and innocent expression coupled with traces of coyness, was enough to capture any man's heart. With a cryptic smile, he lowered his head and pecked lightly at the corner of her lip. Has anyone ever told you that you are a vixen? She ignored the man's provocation by turning her head away. He suddenly looked down when two pieces of sultry sensation swelled up within him. His palm unceremoniously grabbed her waist, and pinched the skin he felt, forcing her to gasp in pain. His breath was tainted with strong cigarette odor that escaped from between his teeth. A sizzling tongue robbed her of her breath as it slid between her lip crevice, gently cloaked her pale pink tongue, and started to suckle lustfully. Monica tried to evade his advances since she was uncomfortable. She yanked him away from her with a ferocious push, his gaze increasingly intensified as she moved her head to inspect the jumping numbers on the elevator panel. Even in a public space like this, inside of an elevator, this man can be so wicked. What if we're caught in the act when we get to the ground floor? Lost in her thoughts, he took this chance to surreptitiously reach for her back and probe the skin within her dress. She regained her senses in that instant and started to struggle madly slapping his chest with both hands to make him stop. When she could not deter his invasive actions, she bit hard on his tongue in a drastic move. The two pairs of lips parted as the blunt pain shot through. Wiping her lips while seething, she gave him a dark look. Stefan, you're going overboard! Earlier when she saw how he had carried Andres with such loving tenderness, her heart was moved, and she had a change of view for this man. Pretense had unexpectedly fallen through at this moment. He was dazed for a second, for he leered at her, his brow arching predatorily. Did this woman just with me again? He felt incredulous and found her even more interesting. This woman looked frail and weak, yet she resisted him time and again. It seemed that even a demure kitten could be ferocious when it showed its claws. One had to know, with his position and status, how many women would flock to him and even willingly lower their dignity for his pandering? Unlike them, this woman was unwilling to be with him. Somehow, he fanned his desire to conquer her. Exerting more effort into this pursuit would be good as well. In this way, he could truly savor the process of overcoming her, which was what he was after. She fearfully retracted her shoulders when she saw his predatory look man had a frightening stare, so in the end, she decided to hang her head low and avoid his look. Amid the suffocating anxiety, the elevator doors slowly parted open with a ding. She looked up with great relief, as if she had just received amnesty, but when she saw the woman standing outside the elevator, her breath hitched as her heart sank. Subconsciously, she pushed the man away and awkwardly called out from the corner of her lips. Aunt? Monica was somewhat embarrassed and felt unsettled as she wondered how much action her aunt had seen. 
her fingers entangling from trepidation. She uneasily walked out of the elevator and reflexively looked up at Stefan for help. The man, though, simply rubbed his lips ravishly, gave her a penetrating look, and whispered to her ear, I'll wait for you over there. The man then turned around and strode off while checking his handphone for the missed call earlier. She was stunned. As she was fumbling for an excuse in her head, she noticed her aunt watching the man's left back. Shocked, Paula Thames asked her niece, Monica, what were the two of you doing just then? She could not possibly mistake it. In the instant when the elevator doors parted open, she caught sight of her niece, who was usually well-behaved, in an intimate embrace with that man. Is he her boyfriend? The man looked to be accomplished and this led her to wonder if her niece was in an illicit affair with him. Monica did not know what to tell her aunt. She bowed her head as her face flushed terribly. When Paula saw her guilty look, she became more suspicious. Monica, do you have a boyfriend now? No, she firmly denied, yet her aunt would not let up and probed further. Then who is that man? What were you two doing inside the elevator just then? He... I... Uh, biting her lower lip, she stammered along for an explanation. Unable to tell the truth in the end, she eventually sipped her lips and spurted, He... he is a professor from my university. A professor from your university? Would a professor lock arms with his student in an elevator? She looked puzzled. Her niece had always been a good girl and a bad liar. She stared her niece straight in the eyes and saw her panicky look. She even knew right away, and without a doubt, that the latter was lying. Monica, I can't believe you've learned to lie after you step into society to work. He's your teacher? He may be able to fool your father, but not me. Is he really your university professor? Don't lie to your aunt. She did not know how to handle the bombardment from her aunt. Clenching her teeth... She maintained her story. He... he is really a professor from my university. He's here in the hospital to visit Andres today. Are you still not going to tell me the truth? Her aunt's voice sank with apparent rage. She seemed to recall something, and went on to ask coolly, I've heard from your father that you did not return home in the past few days. Where did you go? Quizzically pausing for a bit, she continued, are you out gallivanting with that man? Monica, be honest with your aunt. Are you under bad influence and up to no good? Her face turned hotter with shame and anxiety at her aunt's words. She held tightly on her lower lip flap and hurriedly found an excuse to get away. Aunt, um, I, I have something on, so uh, I must go now. I'll explain this matter to you in the future. Episode 147, Slap Aunt, um, I, I have something on, so uh, I must go now. I'll explain this matter to you in the future. Spouting this excuse, she made a quick turn and fled in panic. Paula furrowed her brows and squinted her eyes in scrutiny of her niece's fleeing back. That girl was as suspicious as she sounded. However, she was not her child so she did not care if her niece was indeed up to no good. Even if something shameful were to happen to her relative's family because of her niece, she did not mind, as long as she was not involved. She could not afford to lose her reputation, after all. She stepped into the elevator while thinking of this. Monica was still trembling in trepidation, even when she was out of the hospital gates. Due to that unscrupulous man, who could not behave himself, even in a public space like the inside of the elevator, she was caught in action by her aunt. Thanks to him, she was unable to explain her way out of the fix. A business car was parked by the roadside. The man sitting in the car seemed to have been waiting for quite some time. He had instructed his assistant to drive back to the sports car he had used earlier. She walked over unhappily. The chauffeur opened the car door for her, but she tarried, not wanting to get in. Stefan was lounging languidly in the back seat with his legs crossed and his eyes staring vacantly ahead. He did not even glance her way when she appeared. 
his perfectly chiseled profile, looked restrained and aloof. His lips were pressed firmly into a cold line, and his eyes were only partially open in a lazy manner. He seemed like a haughty emperor most of the time. His presence was one that others could not help but submit to. She was rather upset with him. Why is this man so whimsical? Why does he do what he wants regardless of the occasion? What are you thinking all day in your head? She unconsciously blurted out her thoughts. She caught herself too late and could only bite her lower lip in consternation. She actually told him off. Stefan glanced at her and smiled teasingly. Can you guess what I'm thinking about? Guess? How could I guess? Some words could not be verbalized twice. She bit her lip in resignation and just got into the car. With a pong, the car door went shut. She stared straight ahead and stayed close to the car door and far from him as much as possible. At the same time, she carefully observed him through her peripheral view. A long silence ensued before she opened her mouth to request, I need to trouble you to send me home. I have to prepare a few sets of clothes for Andres. Just as the last word went past her lips, the man reached out his long arm to grab hers and easily pulled her into his embrace. Caught off guard, she struggled vainly for a bit, but still found herself caged in his arms in the blink of an eye. Soothing music could be heard inside the spacious car cabin. His eyes exuded the most playful smile. Arching his thin lips, he asked in his charming, husky voice, Little friend, you haven't answered me yet. What did you just say? His meaning was clear. He could not let her change the topic. She simply closed her eyes and refused to acknowledge him. He had a way to make her open her mouth, though. What did you say moments ago? His eyes revealed a threat. Like this? Her body shook a little. With a fretful face, she subconsciously turned to look at the chauffeur in the driver's seat. He had already aptly turned away the rearview mirror and turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to the scene happening in the back seat. A premonition arose in her heart, and she frantically struggled to break loose from him. The man pinned her down tightly. Their faces were so close to each other that their noses and mouths were touching. Such close proximity only served to heighten her uneasiness. Seeing that his wickedly charming face was up close, she pushed against his chest powerlessly. Why can't this man properly sit by himself? Why did he suddenly pull me? There's someone else in the car, too. She helplessly turned her face away in a flash, but his elegant fingers clenched her chin tightly and forced her to face him. Her eyes squinted and dampened with painful tears as she was forced to look at his face. Her soft and rosy translucent lips looked like delectable cherries. He put his lips on hers, which tasted even better than his imagination. Once he started kissing, he did not want to stop. His kiss was gentle at first, but then his urge took a firm hold of him. Enough, Stefan! Not enough. Oh, you! Infuriated, Monica struggled harder as her body started trembling uncontrollably. Her soft and fair cheeks turned red from embarrassment, a really tantalizing sight to behold. He watched this pleasing scene with much satisfaction. It was a mistake to liken her to a kid. Reassessing her now, she was more of a beautiful and glamorous hobby, one that led him to sink deeper and indulge further. His sudden action gave her a terrible shock. They were still in a car, and with drivers seated in front of them to boot. Was this man going to lay her in front of another man? Feeling more ashamed than helpless, she used all her might to push against his chest. Unfortunately, her modest attempt was not worth mentioning to him. He easily grasped her wrist with one hand. Let go! Let go of me! Slightly out of breath, she panted as she eyed him with annoyance. This did not bother the man at all, however. Pressing against her lips, he arched an eyebrow and asked, Don't you want me to do this? She let out a snigger, gave him a sidelong glare, and said, What did you say? It's nonsense! A teasing look flashed across his eyes. You're seducing me. 
Isn't this what you want me to do? His voice was tinged with evil magnetism as he gasped to her earlobes. He had always been a man of his accord, someone who did not like to bind or suppress himself. Still, he did not really intend to do it with her in the car. With his strong sense of possessiveness, how could he possibly allow his woman to be openly coveted by another man? He just wanted to tease her, for he found her angry look adorable and charming. He liked to admire her when she was in this state. Nonetheless, she took his words for real and thought that this energetic man really wanted to make out with her in the car. You... She glanced sideways at the driver. The man is just too self-indulgent. She saw him getting out of control, and in a fit of anger, she clenched her teeth tightly and lifted her palm out of his grasp. Slap! A crisp sound echoed about. She slapped him without hesitation. The man's face spun to one side. Fuming, she pushed him away and returned to her original seat. Blindsided, he stared at the woman with incredulous and dazed eyes. Even the chauffeur at the front was too stunned for words. With his eyes widening in horror, he held his breath. He had seen a number of strong-willed women, but this was his first time meeting one who dared to hit the president. So awesome. A feeling of admiration and worship arose in the chauffeur's heart. Isn't she afraid of antagonizing him? Her beautiful eyes folded into a taper, and she unhappily told him off. I told you to stop! Do you not hear what I've just said? His face, especially his smoldering eyes, adopted a cold and sharp look. Episode 148 Breaking Out she was unfazed by his deterrent manner. Looking straight into his eyes, she coldly rebuked. Mr. Lewis, may I trouble you to take stock of the situation? Unless you're a beast, you have to pick an appropriate spot for stuff like this, even if you have the urge to mate. You may not care about your face, but I still want my reputation. Pop, this woman actually compares the president to a beast in heat. Well... This is not actually unexpected. After all, the president has been suppressing his urge for a long time. There is no woman, and his so-called fiancé is only in name. He has been suppressing his desires for so long. The chauffeur burst into uncontrollable peals of laughter, but when his glance happened to land in the back seat through the rearview mirror, he saw the man's warning look and immediately swallowed his laughter in fright. Stefan raised his eyes to reveal a sinister look. Are you calling me a beast? Well, do you have trouble comprehending my words? She asked mockingly in return. Did I say that you were a beast? What I said is that only beasts will mate at any time in any place. I didn't specifically single you out. Like a blow dealt sharply at him, he was dumbfounded by her impeccable repute. This woman had a sharp tongue. She did not express it directly, rather inferred him, as a beast, through the innuendo. There was no way for him to rebut, even if he wanted to. Mr. Lewis, you are from a prestigious background, and I believe you have received tertiary education. Do you know the meaning of respect, then? She continued angrily. If you don't understand, why don't I give you a lesson instead? The man spitefully raised his eyebrow. Are you teaching me a lesson? The chauffeur chortled the mirth he could not hold in. He could bear it no longer. Having nowhere to vent his displeasure after Monica's repeated mocking, he arrowed the chauffeur. Jason. Yes, sir. What are you laughing at? Who's the little bastard laughing? Jason hastily feigned puzzlement. Not me, for sure. Did I laugh? No, I didn't. Just now. You. His voice was quite calm, but hidden within was chagrin. Sir, I was staring into space. I neither saw nor heard a thing. The chauffeur was a smart man and quickly found an excuse to cover his tracks. Get lost, the man ordered coldly. Jason wiped the cold perspiration off his forehead, instantly killed the engine, and raised the car partition separating the front and back seats. 
With the car partition in place, the back seat was like a sealed vacuum, isolated from the world outside. What are you doing? She saw the chauffeur get out of the car while the man remained seated with a dark look on his face, making her feel scared. It was obvious that he was antagonized this time. She fearfully sipped her lip. She impulsively slapped him earlier from infuriation, but she was deeply regretting it now. It seemed that she had truly angered him. She turned to open the car door, only to find that it had been locked. The car door could not be opened without a central unlocking device. Behind her, he reached out his long arm and pulled her into his arms with a hug. He asked frostily, Are you satisfied now? Now there are only you and me in the car, and no one else. Her heart skipped momentarily, for she angrily retorted, Are you really a beast? That's right. I am a beast. Coily proceeding toward her, he took in the fresh scent wafting out from her nape at the same time. The smell was no different from his. He felt as if he had been poisoned. He was poisoned by this woman with no antidote available. It was not enough for him. No matter how much he had had, it was never sufficient. He had never craved for a woman like this before. The very potent smell, which could not be removed, seemed to have been cast on him by her. When the man closed in on her, her body went taut. She pushed against his chest as she angrily screamed, No! I don't like to do it inside the car! I like it, though. He countered with an eyebrow slightly raised. Feels exciting. Are you done? Her words were interrupted by his phone's frantic ringing. Stefan raised his brow in dissatisfaction and held up his phone. Monica peeked over out of curiosity. Gracia peered on the lit screen and it pierced her eyes like needles. Unknowingly, her chest became unbearably stuffy. Gracia, his fiance? She instantly felt vexed, but returned to her senses just as quickly. Do they have a bad relationship with each other? They seem distant with their lack of pet names for each other. Those cold words seem not to carry any love at all. Thinking better of it, she raised a brow. Being simple and clear cut is indeed this man's style. Perhaps they have a good relationship, despite the lack of a pet name. What was she worrying about? Reflecting on this, she gradually felt ashamed of herself. She felt like an intruder. This discomfort made her want to clear her name. She did not know where to start at all. Was she not right? At present, how was she different from those women interfering with other people's marriage? Gracia, was she that woman she had bumped into the last time? Her orbs instantly darkened. She thought that something was strange. For some reason... That woman was giving her a sense of deja vu. The woman looked so familiar. It was as if she had left an indelible imprint on her sealed-up memory. Somehow, a piece of memory was currently about to break out in her mind. She was having a splitting headache. He rejected the call. From the corner of his eye, he noticed her be in deep thought, and his beautiful eyes gradually dulled. The Lewis Residence in front of a bright French window, Gracia, who was in her pajamas, squeezed the phone she was holding, her face contorted with extreme rage. He's not answering. He had rejected her three consecutive calls. What in the world is happening here? She returned to the dining table, where a thick pile of newspapers was placed. News of the affair between Stella and a Foxcom higher-up made the headlines. The article was accompanied by text and photographs, and it was truly an eyesore. She casually held up one stack of newspaper and skimmed through its content. Gazing over at that glaring headline, her knuckles turned stiff. Mark, you useless trash. He did not handle the situation competently. He even messed up the job she had assigned to him. She trusted him so much, but he could not even perform this well. She thought that she could wait at ease for Monica's scandal to break out, and then she would be damned to perdition. The biggest scandal for female stars 
was to be exposed for following the unspoken rules. She would definitely be blacklisted. However, who knew that the next day, the one exposed would actually be Stella? Strange. Why was Stella exposed instead? Mark guaranteed to her time after time that everything was properly carried out. His subordinate would personally escort Monica into the vehicle. How did things turn out to be like this in the end? Could that woman have quickly conjured up a counter plan? It's just simply inconceivable. She was peeved and thought that it was improbable. She was having a bad feeling about this. There was clearly something fishy going on. But she could not quite put a finger on it. The maid served the breakfast plates on the table in rapid succession. At the same time, Peter Lewis was slowly making his way down the stairs with the housekeeper's support. She crumpled up the newspapers and immediately threw them into the trash bin. She took his hand from the housekeeper's and carefully supported him. Welcoming him with a smile, she greeted endearingly, Good morning, Grandpa. Episode 149 Grandpa's Rage mm. Gracia helped him to his seat. Grandpa Lewis straightened his posture and raised his chin to survey the entire dining room. He suddenly asked, That bastard didn't come last night! At his mention of this, sadness visibly crept across her face. She replied helplessly, mm. He didn't come home and I have no idea where he's gone off to. He's probably busy at the office. Does the company operate late into the night? Grandpa Lewis sneered and expressed his disappointment. That kid is becoming quite unruly lately. He doesn't even know to return home. Melissa, you should discipline him properly. Grandpa, how am I capable of disciplining him? She pouted and acted coy. Sitting beside Peter, she continued sadly. Grandpa, he doesn't listen to me at all. From a young age, he's never listened to anyone except you. I asked him to return home early last night, but in the end, he doesn't come back for the entire night. To tell you the truth, this isn't the first time he's done this recently. He was never like this in the past, though. Peter nodded in agreement. With that child's indifference, it would be unlikely for him to fool around outside. Unlike those wealthy Casanovas, who accessorized themselves with countless women, that child was never the type to play around with the opposite sex. This was something he had always approved of. His impression of Stefan was that of a responsible father. Despite his busy schedule at work, he had never failed to return home and accompany Sam for dinner. Thus, Peter was becoming concerned about Stefan's recent strange behavior. Noticing that his expression was turning slightly sour, she continued to whisper to his ear, Grandma, you know the nature of a man. Could it be that he has an affair with another woman outside? How dare he? Once Grandpa Lewis heard that, he flew into a rage and slammed his fist at the table, causing the water from the teacup to splatter out. Everything happened so abruptly that the maid standing behind them was startled into hitching her breath. She dared not breathe too loudly. Gracia was elated at this. Peter had always been on Gracia's side. This time, he must back her up. Girl, don't worry. If he's to be unfaithful and cause trouble outside, Grandpa will support you and break his legs. He looked at her dotingly. It was his habit to land a heavy blow on the floor with his walking stick whenever he got worked up. She pursed her lips and glanced at him piteously. Grandpa! Don't be sad. I won't let him betray you, Peter said as he tapped on the back of her hand. His love for her was expressed through this, which transcended mere words. Melissa, you don't have to worry about this. Getting Grandpa's promise to back her up, she was over the moon. Thus, she pretended to have heartache and said, Grandpa, it's all right. If you break his legs, my heart will surely ache. Yours too? Ha. You pamper him too much. 
If you don't supervise a man and show him discipline, he will betray you sooner or later. Peter was speaking from experience. She asked softly, Grandpa, do you remember the surrogate six years ago? I do. His eyes darkened. That girl was specially handpicked by him. She had a youthful appearance, outstanding facial features, and an otherworldly air around her. Her facial features were also very similar to that woman, which was just hard to come by. They were too identical. It was as if they were cast in the same mold. Hence, he took a fancy to that girl at first look. Gracia continued, I think that that girl's background is not so simple. His brows twitched, and he promptly questioned, How so? That woman is quite ambitious and scheming. I have no idea how she managed to sneak into Foxcom's gala. She purposely acted coquettishly in front of Stefan, and constantly tried to get closer to Sam as well. In your opinion, is she pulling some tricks to gain status through her son? Gracia's eyes were overflowing with sorrow as she continued. Sam has never been close to me. I'm afraid that she'll play some tricks to separate us, mother and son. Grandpa, you be the judge. Is she being too much? Recalling the day of the gala, when Monica and Stefan were being intimate with each other on the dance floor, her heart ached terribly. Is she an actress? Grandpa Lewis snorted with contempt. He was an old-fashioned person and was never fond of the entertainment industry, especially female stars. He always thought that they had ulterior motives and questionable backgrounds. None of them was a good apple. Among the wealthy, celebrities were the most despised. In today's context, celebrities were extremely well regarded, yet to affluent people of the older generations, they were considered to be tacky. There was a saying, whores are heartless and actors are immoral, and it was not exactly prejudiced. Thus, people from high society truly looked down on those working in show business. Gracia gritted her teeth and nodded. <laughs> she used some sort of underhanded means to enter the entertainment industry. What do you think, Grandpa? Did she do that on purpose? Huh. An actress from an unknown background. If that brat dares to bring her into the family, then he shall see what I can do. Grandpa Lewis was so enraged that his lips trembled. He knocked the walking stick against the floor and mocked, I can't stand looking at those lowly artists. Also, back then, it was made clear in the contract that she's not to compete for custody rights, or she'd suffer the consequences. If she tried to act willfully now, then she'll definitely get what's coming to her. Gracia chuckled to herself upon hearing this but she continued to put on a helpless expression and said, What if Stefan shields her? What then, Grandpa? You know how some women are born to be vixens. They're born to seduce men. He dares. How will he not dare? She pouted and said indignantly, He didn't return home for two days. He's certainly together with that woman. Grandpa, you have to be my judge. What? Peter burst into a fury and glared. I'll punish him properly when he comes back. Melissa, don't be sad. Grandpa here will back you up. Mm. She nodded in glee. Grandpa Lewis might be over 60 years old. During his prime, he was a person who had braved countless storms and did things viciously. If she were to rely on his viciousness to eradicate this eyesore and thorn in the flesh called Monica... Then she needed not to step in personally. He was, clearly, still livid with rage. He raised his chin to scan the surroundings and asked, with a strange expression on his face, Where's Sam? She hastily inquired to the housekeeper behind them, Where's Sam? Sam is having his early morning training at the archery center. Call him over for breakfast. Yes. She settled down and cautiously extended her hand to caress Grandpa Lewis's chest. She cooed affectionately. Grandpa, don't get mad. Why will you get angry over some not-so-important? Okay, I'll listen to you. I'm not getting angry. I'm not getting angry. After having breakfast, 
Take me out for a walk so I can get some fresh air. He happily held her hand. The anger on his face then dissipated. Episode 150 Talents The Lewis Manor occupied an area of a thousand square meters. Located in the southwest corner was a huge indoor shooting hall. Stefan had always been willing to pour his heart and attention into cultivating Sam. Once the boy learned how to walk, he sent him to a boot camp to observe the specialized training undergone by soldiers. Peter had done the same to his grandson Stefan when he was a child. Every summer, he would make Stefan undergo special training in such a boot camp. Most of the children in the same age group as him were struggling to speak, squiggling randomly on a piece of paper if they had flair, or going after popular toys. As for him, he seemed to have inherited his father's masculine genes. At five years old, he officially joined a boot camp. He did not find the training tough, and in fact, was excited about the experience. His great-grandfather was awestruck by the boy's abilities. Sam was not in the least sense inferior to Stefan as a child, and in fact, he was better than his father. Inside the manor, there was not just a fencing hall, but also an archery hall. The shooting range and the fighting arena were specifically built for Sam. At present, inside the archery hall, total silence reigned. It was so quiet, one could hear a pin drop. Sam was dressed in smart and neat protective gear. His body was standing tall and straight, and in his hands were a heavy set of bow and arrows. He stilled his breath as he focused on the shooting target, set a few hundred meters away from him. His finger buckled at the bowstring. The launched arrow soared through the air wonderfully with a whoosh, as though carrying tremendous sparks. That lightning quick shot hit the bull's eye. Master Sam? His nanny rushed over and waited for quite a bit at the side. When she saw him put down his gear, she opened her mouth and said gently, Dear Sam, your great-grandpa and mom are requesting you to join them for breakfast. He did not seem to hear her. Looking cold and detached, he turned to remove the equipment on his body. With a sudden thought, he faced the nanny and inquired, Did Daddy return home last night? No, Lewis sir did not return last night. Okay. Sam furrowed his brows as his eyes looked down listlessly. After a long silence, he picked up the towel, which was handed to him by a servant, and wiped away the fine droplets of perspiration on his face. I'm not eating. You go tell Grandpa and Mommy that I have no appetite. Ejection could be heard in his aloof words. The nanny looked worried. Little Sam, if you don't have breakfast, everyone will be worried. Besides, skipping breakfast is not good for your body. If that's the case, prepare a set of breakfast for me and send it to my study room. He retorted coolly and then strode off from the archery hall. The nanny sighed softly as she watched the youngster walk away, his back cold and straight. The father and son were truly alike in this aspect. In any case, she had no choice to prepare what he wanted, so she hastily arranged for a set of meticulously prepared meals to be sent to his study room. With one push, the door opened into a quiet and desolate condominium. Stefan followed Monica into her apartment. As he stepped inside, his face immediately revealed a trace of disdain. He did not like this place even a bit with just a glance. It was too small for him. However, to Monica and Andres, this was already spacious. Comparing this apartment, complete with two rooms and one hall, to Matthew's second-hand apartment, this could be deemed as luxurious. Both of them could still have a bedroom, a study room, and a 10-meter hall. However, Stefan, who stood at 1.9 meters, this apartment was a constraining shelter. His hands and feet felt bound in this little space. She went straight to the bedroom to get some change of clothes for Andres, 
The hospital clothes were of poor quality, as the child had sensitive skin. Wearing those must be uncomfortable. Even though the boy did not complain, she was observant. When she saw those red dots on his wrists, which were evidently caused by his skin sensitivity, her heart ached terribly. The clothes she got for her son might not be luxurious, but they were definitely of high quality. He was a sickly child from the very start, so she was always careful in anything concerning him. As she was busy with the errand, the man was left to his devices with nothing to do, so he decided to explore the small apartment out of curiosity. From the entrance, there was a washroom on the left, which reminded him of a fish tank. He was frowning as he walked in and almost hit his head on the door frame. The washroom was really too cramped. Within the seven to eight meters of space, there was an old automatic washing machine, a toilet bowl, and a dressing room. He was careless when he walked in and knocked his knee against the washing machine. He frowned again with great unhappiness and grew more disdainful of this place. This washroom could be described as smaller than a fish tank, because in the Lewis residence, there was a wall-mounted fish tank that was five to six meters in length alone. It was indeed bigger than the washroom. Was a human less than a fish in this comparison? He then went into the kitchen. He instantly caught sight of two matching aprons with teddy bear print. One apron was an adult size, and another was in kitty size. Both looked chummy, hanging like that on hooks. A roaster was posted on the door. He took a peek and saw that Andres was responsible for cooking on Wednesdays, while his mother was responsible for their three meals on weekends. The man smiled and found this interesting. His little baby knew how to cook then. That six-year-old child could actually perform household chores. He wondered how the boy's cooking would turn out. In the south, there were two rooms lined side by side. One of these was a study room. He was astonished when he stepped into the room. There was a fax machine, a printer, and a mahogany study desk with a safe box on top. In addition, there was a pencil case and a thick stack of design sketches. Everything was well organized. What he did not know was that everything in this room was set up by Monica according to Andre's blueprint. It looked like a respectable mini-office. Usually, without his mother's interference, Andres was in charge of this room's cleaning. He glanced at the design sketches on the table and curiously picked up the sheets. He was stunned when he took a look. This thick stack of papers was actually a toy design plan. The lines drawn were skillful and exquisite. Be it the concept or the design itself, the sketch in the manuscript was ingenious. It was clear that this had come from an excellent and professional designer. He could not wrap his head around this. How did this professional design plan end up in his little lad's study room? Episode 151 Sleeping with My Women Stefan? The man looked up to see Monica carrying a heavy load of dirty laundry. She saw the toy design sheets in his hands and warned sternly, Don't touch anything you see in there, or else Andres will get angry. That study room was Andres' little world. She would sometimes enter to dust and air the room, but she never once touched anything else inside. He placed the design sheets down and went out of the room. From the corner of his eye, as if he had discovered the new world, he spotted the bedroom and made a beeline for it. Her forehead broke out in a cold sweat as she stood at the side. This appeared to be just like a noble who was providing for touring the slums. She did not give further thought, however, and just continued carrying the clothes into the washroom. She decided to take this time to wash everything. Meanwhile, the man proceeded to help himself to the bedroom tour. Upon entering the room, a double bed, fitted with a light blue quilt and bed sheet that gave off playfulness and warmth, greeted his eyes. Andres liked blue and preferred simple things, so the bed sheets had a minimalist design. 
Many books were arranged on the bedstand. He picked out a few casually. There were novels, fables, comic book strips, and even fairy tales. He believed that he had finally discovered elements of a child's innocence through this collection of books. He slowly sat down on the bed. Images of Andres leaning on the headboard and lazily flipping through the comic books appeared in his mind. School recommended this list of books to parents. Monica specially purchased a few series at the bookstore according to the booklets and placed them on the bed stand. Before going to bed at night, she would cradle the boy in her arms and gently read him stories from the book. Usually, the little lad had a distaste for these comics and books that were like child's play to him. He found them to be a tad boring and dull, but because he loved his mommy's storytelling, he tolerated listening to them. Her voice was really gentle. To him, falling asleep to her lovely voice was the happiest thing in the world. Small living quarter exuded a lifeful atmosphere and tranquil warmth. The bed in the small room was not large enough to accommodate Stefan's frame, and he could not lay his limbs comfortably, no matter what position he assumed. But as he caught a whiff of a buttery smell belonging to a child, and a refreshing smell, unique to Monica, he somehow felt at peace inside. The amalgamation of fragrance was serene and refined. It was neither extravagant nor intense. It was instead sweet to the soul and healing to the bone. A moment of tranquility wrapped him in its warm embrace. When she stepped into the bedroom again and spotted the man in deep slumber in bed, she reflexively let out a smirk. She clearly remembered a certain man telling her earlier that he was full of vitality. She moved cautiously to the side of the bed and bent down to observe the man's sleeping face closely. The man asleep had his eyes slightly closed. Under the dim lights, faint shadows were formed beneath his sharp features. His long and slender eyes and his thick, jet-black lashes were beautiful and attractive. She raised a brow in surprise. She remembered that, when Andres was born, he already had thick, inky hair, and once he fell asleep, soft and full lashes would frame his eyes. They were much thicker than hers. It turned out that he had inherited them from this man. The bridge of his aquiline nose was tall. He seemed to be a statue, manifested through supreme and careful craftsmanship. This was especially the case for those thin and kissable lips. They were of a form presently, highly sought after for a kiss. They were sane, but arrogant. When he smiled, the curve at the corner of his lips was cool and charming. Monica observed every inch of his face in detail. Suddenly, she truly accepted the fact that this man was good-looking. Sometimes, one could only lament God's bias. He seemed to have generously bestowed this man with the best things in the world. He had given him massive power, a family whose limitless riches could rival a country's, and unparalleled beauty. He was the embodiment of perfection. However, he was given a strange temper to match all these. He was temperamental and had an ill character. Perhaps this was consistent among the rich. He was just always self-centered. When he wanted something, he must get it. If he did not manage to do so, he would rather destroy it than give it away. And if he did not like something, he would not want it, and he could never be forced by others into desiring it. He was clear-cut, but insufferably arrogant. He had the capital to behave like this, though. As these thoughts infiltrated her mind, the man in the bed suddenly popped his eyes wide open, and her scrutinizing stare was met with his. She was taken aback. In the next second, his strong arm circled her waist and pulled her into his embrace. Everything in front of her eyes turned upside down as she was instantly weighed down by the man's body. The double bed was not big, and it could hardly fit two people, but it was very soft. The bed frame slightly concaved under their combined weight, and her body sank in as a corollary. With the man's bulky frame hovering over her, 
it was inevitable that she would find it hard to breathe. Because of his overly massive body, her face had grown red. Hey, Stefan, what are you doing? He lowered his sights and lightly sniffed the fragrance lingering in her hair. In a deep voice, he gracefully whispered to her ear, Sleeping with my woman. What? She thought she had heard it wrongly. Instead, the man repeated it nicely. I said I'm sleeping with you. A little defeated, she refuted him with rage. Every time you think of nothing but this, can't you think of something else instead? Sleeping with my woman. Isn't this something perfectly justified? She might as well give up struggling. How could she forget? This man was all along overbearing and towering above others. He had never cared about other people's feelings. There was no more struggling, and there was no more pushing and shoving. She simply spread herself wide open and let him take what he needed. She shut her eyes emotionlessly without resisting, appearing to be as quiet as a dead fish. Things came to a stalemate because of this, and no advancements came forth from both parties. The man who was pressing on to her caged her in silence, but for a long time, he did not proceed with his next move. She felt slightly uncertain, and through her half-lidded eyes, she saw him looking down at her in scrutiny. All of a sudden, he asked monotonously, Monica, you're really not tactful, aren't you? What do you mean? Those who await my favor would willingly line up all the way from Milan to here. You alone, on the contrary, avoid me like a plague. He peered at her coldly. He had seen plenty of women playing cat and mouse game, and oftentimes, some ignorant ones would execute that tactic in front of him. Thus, he could easily tell right now that this woman's resistance and defiance towards him was not falsified. She was truly avoiding him at all costs. How arrogant! In the right order of things, she should be religiously genuflecting to him in gratitude for favoring her, and should treat this as great patronage. She scoffed. They may be blind, but not me. They are blind. He slightly shifted his body to the side. Using his arm to prop himself halfway up, he composed himself, and then retorted, while peering deeply into her, How are they blind? She was tongue-tied. Why aren't you saying anything? Episode 152 Punishment There are so many women in the world, but why are you so consistent with only me? Mind your own business. Stefan pulled up her chin and inched his handsome face closer to her, pressing his slightly chilly lips to the corner of hers. The warmth of his breath slipped through the gap between her lips and invaded her cavern. His breathing gradually became unstable and a little shorter. His thin, kissable lips journeyed back and forth across her neck. He landed soft kisses on her and ended up only wanting more. He was quite similar to those travelers who felt parched as they got lost in the desert. As for her, she was like a clean and clear magical spring. He tasted her continuously, but his thirst was not quenched. His thin lips pressed along her elegant neckline, and his strong arms hooked across her slim and fragile waist. He applied strength onto her back, subsequently propelling her body closer to his chest. Separated by a thin layer of clothing, he could feel the temperature, suppleness, warmth, and wonder of her skin. He supported the back of her neck with his palm and nudged her forward to welcome his lips. His hot breath poured into her lips completely and instantly. All of her was taken away. No longer satisfied with scratching just the surface, the man lunged more ferociously and delved in wholly. However, unlike his previous advancements, which had gone exploring more deeply, his attacks right now were limited to kisses. The temperature in the room suddenly rose. This realm was filled entirely with affection, romance, and sweetness. 
she withstood everything in silence. He was not resigned to her unresponsiveness. Widening the gap between her lips with the tip of his tongue, he provoked her passionately and enticingly to get a response from her. Nonetheless, throughout the entire session, Monica steadfastly shut her eyes and let him take whatever he needed. If he wanted something, then she would give it to him. It was not something that was too complicated. Even if she were to struggle, it was quite pointless, and she might instead arouse the man's strong desire to conquer her. If she were to spread her limbs out and let him do whatever he wanted, he would definitely find it boring and would perhaps even lose his interest in her. Would she not regain her freedom then? She would be free from this man and return to her normal life. Just like what she had expected, without eliciting any response from her, he simply found this whole matter tasteless and abruptly stopped the kisses. He lifted his gaze to look at her stubborn and prideful face, and his brows slightly knitted in irritation. He felt that this was very dull. He prefers if she struggles or resists. This way, he will at least feel the thrill of conquering her. Monica spreading herself out like this and permitting him to do whatever he pleased caused his interest to drastically wane. He lowered his peeved gaze and bit her ear in punishment. A sharp pain surged from within her, and she grinded her teeth, trying to prevent herself from making any sound. Even if it was painful for her, she did not give any reaction. Do you think that you're a dead fish? Did she actually not know to give a response? Or did she think that it was too difficult doing it with him? I'm giving you what you want, and I'm obeying you. You want me to play nice, right? She ridiculed him with a smile and a slight detest fleeting across her eyes. She hated his rampage and arrogance. She hated his compulsion. Very well. Was this not another level of resistance from her? He immediately looked upward, his lips sliding over her jade-like, well-defined clavicle. He stuck his lips on her neck and fiercely alternated between sucking and biting, his scalding hot breath constantly fanning her skin. She clamped her teeth together. She wanted to hold it in at first, but when she realized the man's vicious and provocative actions, she could no longer tolerate him and pushed him away by force. She stepped down from the bed made her way to the vanity mirror, and stared into it. The woman in the reflection had flushed cheeks and sullen eyes. What greeted her eyes was a suggestive hickey, red and swollen, on the exposed neck. The love bite was glaringly ostentatious, as if Stefan had purposely engraved his mark on her skin. It was such an eyesore. You! She was mad beyond words and used the ball of her thumb to rub it away vigorously, but her attempt only made the mark more swollen and visible. Season had entered midsummer now. The man was out to embarrass her with such an obvious hickey on her neck. How can this man be so crass? She turned to tell him through clenched teeth. Oh, Stephen, you're too much! This is punishment. Punishment? She widened her eyes in disbelief. What an obnoxious man! Furious, she turned around and left the room. As he watched her fume from the back, his lips arched into a contemptuous smile of victory. She went straight to the kitchen. Leaning against the sink, she slightly bowed her head, scooped some water from the running tap, and splashed her burning cheeks with it in hopes of quickly cooling her heated skin. She took a towel and wetted it with water before using it to wipe her cheeks and neck. She rubbed continuously and hatefully, trying to erase his lingering breath and traces on her body. After some time, she finally sighed in vain. Oh, why am I making life difficult for myself? Am I going to torture myself too? Growl. Her tummy let out a long and weak sound. She was hungry. Troubled, she bit her lower lip and opened the door to the fridge. There was not much food left inside. A few eggs a piece of beef, and a bundle of noodles. She thought for a while and decided to cook something to fill her stomach. Once she had a full stomach, she could then rush to the hospital to take her father's place in watching over Andres. She was not that skilled as a cook and only knew how to make some simple dishes. 
When she was still staying at the Thames house, she was in charge of all the chores. At that time, on top of studying to finish her course, she also worked part-time. She was preoccupied enough as it was, yet she still had to prepare three meals at home. That was because her father had a hectic schedule at work. Her adoptive mother hardly cooked, much less her adoptive sister. Once she moved out of her father's house and officially stepped into society, she was always busy with work. Andres was fortunately well-behaved and thoughtful. He knew his mother was preoccupied with work, so he got a few recipe books from the bookstore to learn the skill. In the end, his cooking skill had exceeded hers. The skill was not too bad either. After slicing the beef and sautéing the chunks along with a few more ingredients, she added the noodles into the pan, seasoned it with some condiments, and topped everything with two eggs. Within a short period of time, a heady bowl of noodle broth was carried out of the kitchen by her. He could smell the food from the bedroom. Following the delicious fragrance, he walked out of the room. By the time she returned from the kitchen with chopsticks and a spoon in hand, she saw that the man had already slurped the broth as he sat casually in front of the dining table. It was unexpectedly delicious. The man raised an eyebrow as he licked the soup stains from his lips with the tip of his tongue. It was obvious that he had enjoyed the meal. He bowed and stared at the noodles in the bowl. The noodles had egg toppings and a few beef slices. For some reason, the simple fare, which smelt divine, was able to whet his appetite. He was also hungry without a doubt. He was originally not conscious of it, but when the fragrance wafted into the room, his taste buds had a funny reaction. What is this? He had never seen a noodle broth with such ingredients. The chefs engaged by the Lewis house were from five-star hotels and were among the best in their field. They had excellent culinary skills and could whip up any kind of dishes, and their repertoire included not just American and Western, but also French cuisines. Still, no matter how tasty the food was, it could get tiring after eating the same stuff for over two decades. Therefore, being a novelty, the noodle soup before his eyes was understandably fascinating. Episode 153, Rundown Place After all, Stephen Lewis, who was used to good food and good life since young, had neither seen nor tasted cheap instant noodles before. Don't tell me that he has never eaten instant noodle in his whole life despite his wealth. That is possible. This is common man's food. He won't have a chance to eat it as an elite. She fell silent from the absurdity of this fact. Placing the chopsticks and spoon on the table, the man predictably took them up and started wolfing down the noodles. He actually seemed to be enjoying the meal. Outside the window, sunlight spilled in through the windowsill. He sat with his back erect. Even while he was busy with the noodles, he was still elegant and peaceful in his mannerism. There was no sound coming from him. She now fully believed that he was an elite one who had received excellent etiquette training after witnessing his behavior at the dining table. He might be holding the most ordinary bowl of noodles in his hands, but his every action and mannerism revealed an aristocratic elegance. Sophistication was not pretentious. This table etiquette was incalculated to him for over a decade. The formalities were a part of his persona now. She pouted dismally when she saw that her share of noodles had been snatched by the man. In the end, she resignedly returned to the kitchen to make another share for herself. By the time she carried out the second bowl of noodles, the man had already finished his food. It seemed to suit his taste as the bowl was wiped clean without leftover. She took a look at the bowl. It was really empty. He had finished his food elegantly. No soup stain was spilled on the tabletop. The etiquette of aristocrats is so tedious, isn't it? She mouthed the comment inwardly as she took a seat at the dining table. Holding the bowl, she was in the middle of happily gobbling the food down when she saw him eye it. This is mine, she declared unhappily. To be exact, that bowl of noodles he had just finished was supposed to be hers, too. Seeing the covetous look in his eyes, she quickly shielded the bowl with her hands. She feared that he would also snatch this one, so she warned him. This bowl of noodle is mine. 
Cook one more bowl for me, he demanded. He had just finished a bowl, yet he was still feeling unfulfilled. She had obviously underestimated his appetite. He was a man, after all, and had gone without food for a night. It was only natural for him to feel very hungry now. Her brows lowered frostily, and she simply told him, Go cook one for yourself if you still want to eat. He looked at her straight in the face. I don't know how to cook. You can't cook? Oh, then you deserve to go hungry, she chillingly said, not at all surprised to find this handsome face thinking thereafter. She was feeling smug inside. After being tormented so many times by him, she finally had a chance to take a dig at him. Thus, she resolved to make him watch and suffering as she enjoyed this meal. May you die hungry, she swore at him inwardly with much satisfaction. Skillfully holding up the noodles with the chopsticks, she sucked the strands down her throat. Sip. Unlike him, she was not elegant when she ate the noodles. For him, be it eating a meal with or without noodles, or doing something else altogether, everything must be done in an aristocratic manner. To her, noodles were meant to be sucked. She was really hungry right now, and was too lazy to bother about table etiquette and what not before him. She stuffed her mouth with food in large portions. Moreover, when she ate the noodles, it was difficult for her not to make any sound. He frowned, finding her rather uncouth. Somehow, her eating mannerism, coupled with the sipping sound when she sucked the noodles, seemed to make that bowl of food more appetizing. She, who was busy enjoying her food, failed to notice that the man had crept from his seat to her side. He suddenly leaned forward, caught hold of her hand that was holding the chopsticks, and covered her mouth with his. In one move, he effortlessly slurped the noodle strands that were in her mouth into his. He chewed the delicious food, moving all corners of his mouth in obvious enjoyment of the chase. She was stunned and then roughly wiped her mouth with the back of her hand before she pushed that bowl of noodles in front of him. She had lost her appetite after being teased by him. You can have this. I'm not eating anymore. Why? Are you mad? Can't be bothered with you. Go and finish the noodles. She silently glared at him and headed over to the washroom to dry the laundry, which had just been washed. He was delighted over her indignant look and went back to the table to finish the remaining noodles with much satisfaction. When she was done hanging the clothes, the dining table was already empty. Water was heard splashing from the shower head inside the bathroom. Occasionally, the man could be heard cursing. Having spent a day at the stuffy hospital and having perspired much from eating that heady meal, Stefan decided to take a shower. He did not expect to find fault with the water heater, though. While showering, he discovered that the water could only flow hot and cold intermittently. This was a grave inconvenience for an elite like him who was used to a good life. Her mouth twitched. Huh. This man had really taken this house as his. Just as she finished washing the dishes, there was a knock on the door from the outside. Quizzical, she went to open the door and was dumbstruck by the scene outside. Standing along the narrow corridor were two rows of expressionless men in black suits. Two men standing in front of the respective queues walked into the apartment, uninvited, with a pile of clean clothes in their hands. At this moment, the door to the shower room opened, and he walked out with a sullen face. His face was dark from having to use the faulty water heater. The men in suits stood at attention on one side and passed him the clothes. He had a teddy bear bath towel wrapped around his lower body, with his upper torso entirely naked. Her gaze fell on the teddy bear bath towel, and she was instantly piqued. This towel was specifically bought for Andre's. After each bath, the little lad would wrap himself in this towel, which covered his body just right. However, on this man, it could only barely cover his midsection, including his private parts. Hey! She pointed at the bath towel on him neutrally. That's Andre's. Unhappy, he threw her a sidelong glare. So? My son has obsessive compulsive behavior. She mocked him with a straight face. With a twitch of his mouth, he could no longer maintain his grace. Woman, 
How dare you let my son stay in such a run-down place? Run-down? She instinctively reacted in anger, finding him unreasonable. The monthly rental fee for this so-called run-down place is $2,000. Like you, Stephen Lewis, with your rich family. This place is decent enough. Except for that faulty water heater. Episode 154. I'll buy it myself. Run down? She instinctively reacted in anger, finding him unreasonable. The monthly rental fee for this so-called run-down place is a few thousand dollars. Like you, Stephen Lewis, with your rich family. This place is decent enough. Except for that faulty water heater. Calling this place run down. This man is simply too much. Do you think that everyone else is like him? Coming from a rich family with a heap of fortune to spend? This is the capital! This isn't a small city from second or third tier. The stretch of condominiums over here may not be deemed as high class, but they're still costly. So the monthly rental for an apartment in this part of the capital is considerable. Stefan rebutted. Such a rundown place and you still need to pay rent? Yes, of course. The men in suits waited on him as the man changed into the set of fresh clothes. He impatiently rubbed his damp hair before he walked up to her and held her up. Let's go. Oh, uh, where are we going? I'm not letting my woman and my son stay in this pigsty. Pigsty? Wait a minute. Did you call my house a pigsty? She was about to explode when he strode over and without any explanation, half lifted and half carried her off to the entrance. With a kick, the door opened. Hearing the ruckus, her landlord, who was staying across the hall, opened the door to investigate. She was taken aback when she saw the stairwell clogged with the men dressed in dark suits. She looked up to see a tall, broad man carrying a woman down the stairwell. After she recovered from her shock and identified the woman as her tenant, she approached her and said, Hey, I haven't seen you in the last couple of days. You're responsible for this month's rental fee. Monica was a tenant in one of the apartment units that belonged to this landlord. When the property first went on the market, the woman bought two flats, one of which she planned to use as a future wedding home for her son. However, the son was still in high school. It was a waste to leave it empty, too. Thus, in the interim, she had at least after some simple renovation. Before she could finish her words, Stefan impatiently replied, We aren't renting this place anymore. Uh, the landlord was dumbfounded as she watched them leave the place. Mr. Lewis, how about this unit? This place measures 532 square meters and is fitted with seven rooms, three halls, and five security guards. It also comes with a private garden and a swimming pool. The villa has a total of five floors and a private elevator. Inside a real estate company's headquarters, a manager coyly presented a selection of luxurious golf walk villas to the cold and aloof man sitting on the sofa. He took the brochure from his hands, glanced at it, and bowed his head to ask for the opinion of the woman in his arms. Do you like it? Monica was still somewhat in a daze as she shook her head. When she rejected with a shake of her head, the man did not pursue the reason for it and just neutrally looked at the manager, who was full of anticipation. Change. Sure, Mr. Lewis. Please wait a moment. The manager did not express any irritation as he respectfully retreated. The woman looked up and surveyed her surroundings. To her, it was like being in a dream. Golf Walk was an upmarket residential district being developed by a real estate company under Makewell Financial Group. A clientele interested in owning a piece of land in that district had high net worth. A villa with 500 square meters had an average price of $80 million. After conversion, it was on average $160,000 per square meter. That level of luxury was simply staggering. That district had villas, bungalows, and even high-end apartments available for those high-level white-collar workers. The design of the recently presented apartment was retro Mediterranean style which was luxurious and dignified with unique elegance. It was considered as one of the most luxurious properties in the capital. Initially, 
The manager did not recognize Stefan's face and just took him for an ordinary customer, so he did not put much effort into his sales spiel. After all, as a mere manager of a real estate company, a person with an ordinary status like him would normally have no chance to meet the CEO of Makewell Financial Group in person. Therefore, when Stefan entered the reception hall with Monica locked in his arms, he treated them like nothing more than normal guests. He had never expected, however, that their CEO, who was shrouded in mystery, would be this young and astonishingly handsome. Who was this woman beside him, though? He had heard that their CEO had a fiancé. Perhaps this lady with the one? Thinking for the better, as he assumed that he had understood everything, the manager put up a smile. His attitude did a 180 and became more servile. Sir, please take a look. What do you think of this one? It's an extravagantly furnished western-style garden house that spans a surface area of 232 square feet, surrounded by a tranquil environment. Stefan slid the brochure to Monica. Like it? She could not keep herself holding the brochure up. It's so beautiful. This beautiful lady here, are you satisfied with this? Noticing her finally gaining interest, the manager respectfully asked this question while maintaining a smile on his face. I like it, but it's too big. Is there something smaller? She was just about to move into a new house. Matthew had passed her a bank card with a tidy sum in it. However, a house of 232 square feet was a tad too big. Living together with Andres and her father, it would appear to be too roomy. Feeling somewhat distressed, the manager simpered, <laughs> This is already the smallest house. What about an apartment? She inquired again. The manager wiped his sweat off and answered her helplessly. All units were sold out within five months of the opening of its first phase. Second phase is still under development. Don't like it? Chagrined, she answered. I like it. The style of this garden house was her favorite. Designed like a vintage palace, it was refined and beautiful. It was her dream home. I'll take this then. Stefan's long and slender finger pointed at the brochure. All right. Mr. Lewis, please hold on for a moment. The manager closed the brochure, and just as he was about to walk away, she called out to him in panic. Wait! Miss, do you still have any requests? The manager asked curiously. She answered, I'm still considering it. What are you considering? Stefan's expression sank. When I asked her if she likes it, didn't she reply that she does? Why is she having so many considerations now? She shrugged him off and asked the manager, How much is this? When the manager heard that, he was also stunned. Stefan knitted his brows. This isn't something you need to consider. Why is this something I don't need to consider? What if I'm incapable of purchasing it? Corner of the manager's lips twitched. Is this girl not Mr. Lewis's lover? She doesn't seem to be, though. I've heard rumors that Mr. Lewis is not the type to be intimate with women easily. If she's not his lover, why is Mr. Lewis looking for a love nest to keep his lover in? He has Silver Lake, a massive villa, registered under his name. And he specially purchased yet another house? Woman, are you foolish? Stefan flashed her a look of dissatisfaction. I don't need you to buy this for me. I'll buy it myself. He stared at her deeply. She glared at him back, looking stubborn and angry from embarrassment. She was clearly annoyed by his charitable act. Episode 155 The Two-Faced Little Boy He stared at her deeply. She glared back at him, looking stubborn and angry from embarrassment. She was clearly annoyed by his charitable act. Suddenly... He broke into a profound smile and let himself casually sink into the sofa. He stretched out his hand lazily, signaling for the manager to state the price. Hello, this is $45 million. Monica froze. Stefan was admiring her shocked expression. He could not help but tease her when she stayed in a daze. What? Did she say you want to buy this? I... She was at a loss for words. 
She thought that since a villa is so expensive, a mere garden house should not be as expensive as that. She bit her lip in depression. Why aren't you talking tough anymore? He asked her indifferently. He raised his head and signaled a manager with his eyes. The manager stepped away at once. The procedure to apply for property ownership was not too complicated, and everything was completed unbelievably quick. In fact, when the manager passed her the deed for the house, she had yet to return to her senses. Stefan, who was standing next to her, slightly bowed his head to admire her dumbfounded look. He asked with much delight, Are you touched? Now you don't have to sleep in the slum again. Why are you giving me this house? Are you taking advantage of this to coerce her into signing some unequal treaty? He saw her look of vigilance and could not help but smilingly tease her again. Are you going to let me watch my son sleep in a pigsty? It's not a pigsty, she emphasized sulkily. He cast her a sidelong glance but did not speak further. To him, that place was no different than a pigsty. It was small and unsafe. Tens of families, or perhaps even more, lived in the same building. Meeting strangers was unavoidable. Plus, security was a lot. Anyone could come and go freely. How could he allow his woman and son to live in that foul place? However, this woman in front of his eyes was being obstinate, carefully protecting that pitiful pride of hers. For some reason, he did not refute her and simply said, This is a gift. She froze up for the second time gift for that bowl of noodles. She was a little confused. What did he mean? A plain bowl of noodles in exchange for a luxurious house? Was her bowl of noodles equivalent to a few million dollars in value? God! She had no doubt. Struck lottery. Since you put it that way, if I were to make a few more bowls of noodles, then would you gift me a few more houses? He stared at her speechlessly. She looked at him in a challenging manner. If he gave his consent, she would no doubt prepare noodles for him every day. This would go on until he was exhausted of his riches. His phone rang, timely breaking the sinister silence. He originally wanted to reject the call, but as soon as he looked at the screen, his expression turned solemn. He excused himself immediately and answered the call with his voice lowered. Grandpa. Over the phone... The old man seemed to be suppressing the chilliness and sullenness in his voice. You finally picked up the phone. Perhaps, if I didn't call, you wouldn't even remember where you live. The old man noted his silence and exploded in wrath. Do you still know to return home? Gracia called you so many times. Why didn't you pick up the call? Do you regard her as your wife and me as your grandpa? Grandpa, I'm yet to marry her. He replied emotionlessly. What do you mean by that? What of it? She's still your fiancé, your future wife. Are you trying to make my blood boil? Peter choked in his anger and started to cough fitfully. This incited him into uttering expletives. You're definitely trying to piss me off on purpose. Grandpa. He roared in exasperation over the phone. No more nonsense. I'm giving you 20 minutes to return home pronto. Doot, doot. The line went dead. Stefan's expression abruptly turned sullen. Andres awoke in a sweltering hot afternoon. Opening his eyes, he discovered that he had unknowingly been moved to another ward. And a deluxe room at that. Extravagant furnishings, elegant design, and high-quality equipment, a luxurious environment, had actually been created in a hospital ward which was complete with a lounge, a study room, and a washroom. He scanned the room and found Matthew sleeping in the accompanying bed. The latter looked exhausted as he huddled in his clothes and let out soft but deep snores. Why is it him? He slightly furrowed his brows, but did not concern himself with his grandpa and just let the latter continue sleeping. He did not harbor much resentment toward the old man simply thought him to be useless, too useless that his mommy had to suffer so much. In his opinion, any man who let his mommy suffer was useless. Were words needed to explain why they failed at protecting someone well? They were all just excuses. Still, if his mommy chose to forgive him, 
he would choose to forget to. His stomach growled. Andre stroked his tummy, feeling quite hungry. He got off of the bed and trudged towards the lounge in his slippers. He spotted Frederick sitting upright on the sofa. When he noticed him coming over, he quickly stood up and greeted him respectfully. Mr. Thames. Mm. Why are you here? As he asked this question, his tummy gave off yet another growl. Frederick looked at him, and with a smile in his eyes, he asked, Are you hungry? Mm. Andres turned away in embarrassment. He felt that his agent's smile was a tad too bright. Did you bring anything to eat? Yes. I knew you'll feel hungry when you wake up, so I brought over your favorite bento. Saying this, he brought out a bento and placed it on the table. Aren't I a loyal assistant? Where's my mommy? When I arrived earlier, she's no longer here. He nodded in acknowledgement and rested on the sofa, savoring the bento in elegance. Frederick took this chance to pull out a stack of documents collected during the meetings with the board of directors and pass them all to him. Andres received the files and flipped through them. They contained the proposals presented in the meetings. Eventually, these would all be handed to him to make the final decision. He would sign if he agreed to a proposal and would not if he did not. Sifting through the documents, he eventually stated flatly, Those trashes waiting for cash to roll in are truly getting useless by the day. Andre's brows gradually formed a tight knot as he continued looking through the files. Suddenly, he flung the documents in his hands away. They then scattered all over the floor like falling snowflakes. He stood up and sat emotionlessly as he walked towards the French window. How useless can they get? Why don't they go lie in coffins now? I'll kindly burn some paper money for them. Frederick fell silent. What a two-faced person, the agent thought to himself. However, this was also typical of the little boy. Mr. Thames, these documents... Episode 156 A Creditor at the Door Andre Scott huh. Taking such great pains to replace me. They really don't know their place. Flustered, Frederick said at once, No one in the company can replace your position, Mr. Thames. That is obvious. He turned to look him deeply in the eye. Without me, that company is nothing but a wasteland. The agent was shocked. The statement, although it was said calmly, it held much menace in the guts. If this were to be said by someone else, it would seem to be too egotistical. However, coming from this little boy's mouth, this could only be wholly accepted. Then, the acknowledgments for the document. All rejected. Understood. The man was tidying up the documents when he suddenly got up and asked, Mr. Thames, the person outside the door, would you like to meet her? Who? Rosie. He opened the door to Rosie standing outside restlessly. Who knew how long she had waited there? The moment she saw the door getting unlocked, her face lit up. But when she saw a sullen-faced Andre stepping out, her heart instantly sank. Why is it you? He cast her a cold glance, and then mocked her absurdity. This is my mom, so why can't it be me? She was stumped for a moment, but reminded herself that this was simply not the time to be bickering with him, and just demanded, Where is your mommy? I want to see her. He smirked, not having any respect for her at all. Who are you to meet my mommy whenever you like? This question made her flush with shame. And she exclaimed hastily, Why are you being so tough, kiddo? Why are you speaking to your elders like this? You're only befitting of this way of speech. You. Infuriated, Rosie held up her hand to slap his small face. This was a repeat of her reckless abuse to him back at the Thames house. Andre simply stared at her coldly with his head raised. A strong gust of wind accompanied her hand's descent to his face. Her eyes were unwavering, and were even teeming with indifference. Frederick's face darkened. 
He stopped her hand with his swift reflexes and pushed her to the ground by twisting her wrist. Her butt seemed to crack into pieces as it landed on the hard floor with a heavy thud. Frederick's hand was quite strong. With him as her opponent, she did not have the strength to deliver a counter blow at all and could only let out a bitter cry of pain. Andres trod towards her while he maintained his indifferent gaze on her, his lips curling into a mocking and distant arch. Rosie, why are you looking for my mommy? She grimaced in pain, and at his question, jeered derisively. If there's anything, I'll discuss it with your mommy, and not you. What does a child like you know? <laughs> Andres, you're increasingly getting out of hand. I am your elder. I don't listen to nonsense. He interrupted her impatiently. Since you want to ask my mom for help, you must give me a reason why she should help. There was a sudden change in her expression, and a tinge of distress appeared on her face. At least, she should help us for the sake of our mother-daughter kinship for two decades. Kinship? What kind of kinship? Was it the kind where my mother had to suffer all the bullying for the past two decades or more? Or was it the mocking and sarcasm I had to hear from you? He could not forget the dark and heavy memories of his childhood. If that was what she was referring to as kinship, then... He smiled lazily and said, All right then, for the sake of kinship. Oh, you! Which room is it? It might be due to Andres' exceptional charisma, or she must be under a spell, for she woodenly replied to him, 502. Let's go. He faced his agent and gave this instruction. Frederick immediately followed behind. He was actually keen to find out what kind of a tragic ending the mother-daughter pair would have. The agent turned around and glanced pathetically at Rosie offering a few seconds of silent condolences in his heart. It was not good to offend Andres, this little demon king. One would not know how death comes about. Rosie could not be blamed for creeping her way here for help. She had nowhere to turn to, and this was already her last resort. Andres came to the ward entrance and saw a group of curious onlookers crowding at the door. He was in no hurry to go in, Instead, he stood at the door and peeked into the room through the window. Hiding in the corner while covering herself as she howled in pain was Emma. Her voice was hoarse and broken. Her wounds were already showing signs of infection. The bandage had been ripped off and scattered all over. At this moment, Frank Utes was standing by the hospital bed. Occasionally, he would be seen kicking her vigorously with the sole of his shoe as he shouted, I told you to return the money. Did you not understand? Do you think that you can avoid me by hiding in the hospital? Bitch! Sir Frank, I don't... I really don't. No money? I think it's because you don't want to return what you owe. Well, if that's the case. I'll just distribute your photos. Who knows? They may fetch a good price. He suddenly revealed a stack of photos in his hand, featuring Emma, which could easily destroy her reputation. They got her so frightened and shocked. She made a lunge for him in an attempt to snatch the photos away from his hand. No! He was furious at her sight, and with a kick, sent her flying toward a corner of the wall. Her head had a big cut after it hit the wall and she coughed out a pool of bloody foam. It's so disgusting, Andres coldly muttered to himself. Rosie moved to rush over, but stopped in her tracks at the door upon seeing the mess in the room. She did not have the guts to step in further. Frank was an infamous ruffian in this district. She had seen how ruthless he could be before. It was unknown how he managed to track her daughter to the hospital. Rosie was scared out of her wits. When she saw this creditor come in through the door, she quickly fled the hospital room and looked for Matthew and Monica to settle the matter. The two had the money. She could ask them for help to pay off the debt. They should not be so heartless to leave them in the lurch. However, 
seeing her daughter's pathetic condition right now. She begged for mercy on her knees. Rosie's legs could not seem to move a bit somehow. She was afraid that she would be implicated. She would not be strong enough to stand the beating. Being in a public place did not deter the street boss from his viciousness. The other patients and their families in the ward had long since fled the room in fear. Episode 157 I will pay for her. Being in a public place did not deter Frank from his viciousness. The other patients and their families in the ward had long since fled the room in fear. He was not there to create unnecessary trouble for other folks and was only in the hospital to retrieve what Emma owed him. Rosie went weak at the knees and hid at one side, unsure of what to do. She was terrified beyond words and could barely utter a cry. Andres gave her a frigid look. Apparently, this mother-daughter kinship could not endure beyond troubles like this. This is a debt brought about by her doing. She has to bear the consequences of her retribution. As he was thinking, he turned to leave. However, just as he was about to take a step away, he heard Emma's desperate cries drifting from the ward. I really have no money, Brother Frank. My sister has... She definitely has money. You can go look for her. I'm her younger sister, so she'll definitely help me. The boy instantly halted his steps. A cold and eerie look flashed across his eyes in a sharp burst as a dark and dangerous aura permeated his very being. He looked past his shoulder and into the room. She was wailing and holding the edge of Frank's pants as if it were her last straw of hope. Emma cried out, My sister has money. You can look for her. She will definitely help settle my debt. She helped me pay off the money I owed before, too. Andres held a stunning look with his fists tightly clenched. Mommy helped pay off her debt? When did that happen? How come I did not know about it? Emma, Emma, haven't I made it clear to you that day? You got me into deep trouble that time, don't you know? You told me that your sister is pure and lovely and excellent chick to repay your debt. In the end, it turned out that she's not a chick and even has an illegitimate son. The main point is that she has a paymaster looking out for her. I didn't get the chance to touch even a finger of her, for I was almost made to pay with my life. Do you think I'm going to be tricked by you again? and look to her for trouble. You may have the guts, but not me. If you want, go and ask for the money yourself. I don't dare to look for her again. This little lad's face was locked in a deep frown. The collar drained from his face, and he now looked completely ashen. Brother Frank, don't force me, please. She continued to cry out helplessly. I really didn't know that she has a paymaster backing her. You know now, right? Damn, I haven't seen such a heartless person like you. Your sister has been good to you all along. Apparently, that wasn't the first time she had helped clean up your mess. From what my men told me when they went to collect your debt from her, she had had enough of you. And if it weren't because they threatened her about the son, she would not really bother to pay off your debt. A child's tender voice was heard from the entrance out of the blue. When did that happen? He looked past his shoulder and spotted a boy, looking pale, standing at the door. His charming eyes were hollow and deep like the abyss. Where did this unknown lad come from? Frank swore with a frown. You don't need to know who I am. Explain what you've just said. Andres had no intention of his rudeness. His voice might still be tender, but his tone was gloomy and cold. All this while, he had been exuding a somewhat fear-inducing, dangerous aura. The man was stunned by the child's behavior in front of him. The boy looked to be six or seven, but his presence was astonishingly steady and mature. He had an impeccable charisma that almost overwhelmed his spirit. It was obvious that he was losing his presence before this little lad. Andres was unhappy with his hesitation 
and prompted once more. Speak! What did you say? Why should I explain anything to you? As Frank asked these questions, he looked up to survey the crowd outside the room and rudely demanded, Whose kid came running out here? Take him back right away. The crowd immediately scattered from shock. Andre said sternly, You're here to get your money back, aren't you? Explain yourself clearly. I'll pay you the money. Where will a kid like you get the dough from? I have the money. Frederick stepped forward from behind the boy with a smile. The gangster was even more confused. Emma seemed to have detected a ray of hope from this. She pointed to the little boy at once and blurted out, He... he is my sister's son. Oh, that Monica Thames is your mommy? You don't need to be too concerned with me. I'm asking you, how much does she owe you? The boy questioned seriously. He spared no attention to Emma. It was as if looking at her once would pollute his eyes. Twenty thousand dollars. The boy turned to the side and lowered his voice. Frederick. Yes? Frederick suddenly fished out a checkbook from his briefcase and penned down a string of numbers. Lastly, he signed his name and flashed it to the gangster. The sum of a million. Frank spaced out. Oh, ho. this kid is no simple character. Emma looked at him with tears brimming in her eyes, and when Frederick flashed them the amount on the check, her face instantly lighted up with hope. However, soon after, she thought that this was ridiculous. Who was this man clad in a suit and leather shoes? One could tell that he was an elite with one look, yet why was he being so servile toward her nephew? Standing at the door, Rosie was dumbfounded as well. Who exactly was this man that he could give out a million check this simply? The more shocking thing was that this man was being respectful towards Andres, a mere child. He appeared to be submissive. What was the relationship between the two? She truly did not understand. Frank let out an evil grin and went ahead to retrieve the check only to grab at nothing as Frederick's hand, which was holding the check, slightly moved away to evade his grasp. Are you kidding me? The gangster was a little enraged. Andre said expressionlessly, You have yet to explain. What did you mean by that just now? The street thug snickered as he pulled Emma toward him by the collar, tapped one of her bloody cheeks, and said, She's your mommy's sister, right? Huh? She played with drugs and gambled outside, and she owed me a big sum. This bitch here said she's penniless, though, so I threatened her that I'll go to her house to retrieve my money personally. Scared out of her wits, that's what she said. He loafed around, so his words were naturally crude and his appearance mean. He truly looked like a ruffian. The little boy let out a sound of assent and waited for him to continue. She said she's going to use her sister to pay off her debt. The thug slowly spoke. In an instant, the little lad's expression changed for the worse. It had darkened like smeared ink. A murky haze suddenly swept across his previously bright and clear eyes. An intense hostility poured forth from beneath his gaze. Go on, he demanded. The thug was dazed. He was a little unhappy that a child was talking to him in such a condescending manner, but he did not give it much thought, and continued. She said that her sister was so elegant, serial, delicate, and pretty. When I heard that, my heart tingled. The main point? The little boy was getting quite frustrated. Damn, you little bastard! The gangster was mad. The agent coughed once to draw his attention and then smilingly dangled the check in front of him. Episode 158 What an Irony Frank gulped and could only carry on. She promised me that, in exchange for her debt, she would send her lovely sister over to accompany me for a few nights. Upon hearing this, 
Andre stared at Emma by the side, and for a long time, he remained silent. His expression darkened to a frightening extent. She didn't eventually manage to pull it off, though, that Monica was taken away by people from the Lewis family. The Lewis family? Frederick was stunned for a moment. Stephen Lewis? <laughs> the little boy suddenly let out a few eerie sniggers. His half-lidded eyes suddenly burst wide open, and they locked on to Emma. He stared at her so intensely that his gaze seemed capable of puncturing a cavity through her. It was like this, huh? <laughs> he supported his forehead with his hand. His frightening, chilly laughter rang about, making one's hair stand on end. Emma had never seen him like this before. He was always obedient and lovely in front of her adopted sister. But now, with his facade torn down, his coldness and darkness were in full display. It was as if a terrifying air of wrath had surrounded him. His solemn eyes, in particular, had waves of crazed hostility swept over them. You! What are you laughing at? <laughs> his shoulders rippled, and he laughed even more maniacally. He closed his eyes and allowed those unpleasant memories to flood his mind. Scenes appeared from the past. Emma propped him on the bed and repeatedly slapped every part of his body viciously. She pulled at his ears, and her sinister voice constantly echoed in them. You bastard! Go ahead and cry! Go ahead and shout! Your mommy's not at home right now! So who can help you? Who can protect you? Those memories he had sealed away burst out from their container under her incitement, and they continuously fleeted right before his eyes like a merry-go-round. <laughs> Slightly shaky laughter contained some of the pain from his forcibly stimulated, unwanted memories. The thug shook his head and sighed. It's unexpected that you're willing to pay off her debt. Are you returning her in gratitude with kindness? She hurt your mommy like that. Don't you hate her? Hate? The little boy's eyes suddenly popped open, and an overwhelming hostility passed under their surface. How could he not hate her? He hated her thoroughly. Ah, I wanted to throw her into the pond to feed the fish. I heard before that she's going to be an actress, so I took a bunch of photos of her. Now that she's disfigured, her road stardom is cut off. Since you're paying her debt for her, I'll give you these photos instead. Frank handed the photos to him and reached for the check in the agent's hand once more. The agent captured his wrist grimly, and he could not budge his hand at all. Why are you going back on your word? Did I say that I'll pay for her debt? Andre's voice was filled with aloofness and contempt. Emma's heart was instantly in her throat yet again. She thought she was saved. But why was this boy being inconsistent with his words? Was that check originally a fake? Was that why he went back on his words? She felt that she was on an emotional roller coaster ride. One moment she hung high, and another moment she hit rock bottom. Just now, you said, the boy retorted indifferently. She owes you so much, and then you plan to throw her into the pond. How pitiful is she? He pitied his mommy for her many years of suffering if his aunt's debt could easily be written off just like that. Frank assumed that he did not have the heart to make her suffer and was about to suggest something else when he heard Andre say unsympathetically, You're letting her off lightly simply by throwing her into a pond. Suddenly, with eerie laughter, he threw the stack of photos he was holding into the air and said, Chop her into pieces and feed her to the sharks. She will not be missed. The voice was as tender as ever, but at this moment, the tone was dark and sullen. The words that came pouring out of his mouth were cold and chilling, sending shivers down their backs. Receiving the shock of her life, Emma scampered behind Frank. To her, Andres was more terrifying than this old-time gangster. Her mother 
who was standing at the door, also held her breath in fear. No one took the six-year-old's words as child's play. Everyone could only watch the spine-chilling expression on his tender face. The eyes he used to look at Emma were filled with hatred and cruelty. It was as if she were an utterly filthy thing. Little boy, are you kidding me? Dumbstruck, the gangster could only laugh dryly. How can someone be so ruthless at such a young age? This is really scary. Am I kidding you? He threw the question back in a low tone. Why would I tell you a meaningless joke when my time is precious? Then... The man cleared his throat. He was starting to be awestruck at this six- or seven-year-old lad. Licking his upper lip flap, he continued, You mean to say... I'll give you the money, and you settle this business for me. Do you understand? The gangster still could not wrap his head around this. His doubting eyes shifted to Frederick, who was standing beside the boy. He saw that the agent was looking at Andres with deeply furrowed brows and eyes containing a myriad of emotions, such as heartache. Agent Frederick. Andres. Frederick suddenly squatted before the child, caught off his shoulders, and told him in a deeply saddened voice, Don't be blinded by revenge. Andres did not seem to hear him, as he coldly instructed, Pass him the money. The boy would not dirty his hands over such lowly folks. He would let others do the dirty work for him. The agent's face was still filled with complex emotions. Andres. I told you to give him the money. Do you understand? The boy repeated with a pale face. Holding the agent's hand, he looked at him intently. Frederick fixed his eyes on the wan face before him and frowned once more. Hesitating as he stood up, he finally passed the check over to Frank. As if struck by lightning, the mother-daughter pair stood numbly on the spot. The gangster seemed to be experienced in settling such matters. He inspected the check, and once he was assured of its authenticity, he could not help feeling incredulous. This is no simple child at all. How does he possess the charisma of an exceptional adult and wealth at such a young age? Although he still had no idea where this boy had come from, he knew that it might not be a good thing to know too much. Sure then, I'll take them away. Do you want me to take some pictures for your viewing pleasure once I'm done? He barely finished his words when Emma, who was at his feet, crawled to the boy and cried for mercy as she hugged his little frail body. <laughs> Andres! Andres! Tom's fault! It's my fault! I was dumb in the past! I'm sorry! I swear I'll never bully you again! Bully your mommy too! The child did not seem to hear her plea as he continued to stare straight ahead without sparing her a glance. What an irony! In the past, Emma would look at him with disdain and would call him distasteful names. Now, she was kneeling beside him and begging for mercy while kowtowing. Frederick, who was standing beside him, hatefully shook off her hands that were holding the boy's shoulders. Rosie was also crying tearfully before the boy as she crawled to him on her hands and feet, prostrating and begging for forgiveness. Andres, are you really going to get rid of us? At least, for the sake of your grandfather... Please let us go. This is murder. It's against the law and your conscience. Oh, I'm buying murder. Andres casually muttered, and then, with an eerie smile, asked the room at large, Who heard that? There was a deafening silence in the room. Who would believe the words of a six-year-old child? How would it be possible for a six-year-old child to instigate murder? In the suffocating silence, his adoptive aunt kept prostrating before him with her head repeatedly knocking hard against the floor as she exclaimed hoarsely, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I know I'm in the wrong. She cried wretchedly as she reached out to hold him. The boy ignored her and coldly shook off her hands. 
Don't touch me. You are filth. <laughs> Andre. Her tear-stained face looked desperate and pathetic. I can't forgive. I absolutely cannot forgive. He retracted his shoulders, turned around, and coldly retorted, Rosie, six years ago, you forced my mom to become an unwed mother at 18 years old. She sacrificed herself for the Thames family. But how did you treat her in the end? He continued, one word after another. Rosie, I've long wanted to get rid of you. Emma mournfully wept and begged again. Please give us another chance. He rebuked. I've given you many chances, but you two didn't know how to treasure them. Rosie was stunned. I strove to become powerful for my mother's protection. You tried harming her time and again, and now you're asking me to forgive? Impossible. With that, he turned and walked out of the ward. Frank's henchman arrived at the scene of Rosie wailing after the little boys leaving back. You can't be so cruel! The boy refused to acknowledge her. He quickly departed from the room, leaving behind two's despondent voices. When he reached his room, Andre stood at the door, which was just closed after him, and started to tremble coldly and violently. Frederick was filled with heartache at this sight and held him tightly. The boy's frail body could not stand up to such trauma and collapsed in his arms. Although this child was not his flesh and blood, he had come to regard him as half his kin after working under him in the past year. His heart was full of admiration for the child at his unscrupulous ways of handling business. Seeing the boy's cute side before his mother and the innocent eyes he used to gaze at his mother, he could tell that they were not fake. They were truly his original true self. However, Hatred had blackened this purity. He had thought that the boy was acting before everyone. He no longer thought so after this incident. What kind of childhood did this child have that made him commit such cruelty? Cruel, indeed. This was especially so for a child. He had not fully understood Andre's dark and gloomy past that resulted in his drastic desire to kill. Under the dimming dusk, the man hugged the child tightly in his embrace with heart-wrenching pain. Episode 159 Wedding Preparations The Lewis Residence Stefan parked the car in the garage, walked into the hall, and saw Grandpa and Gracia waiting for him. Grandpa was sitting on the master seat with a grim face. Gracia, who was kneeling beside him, was carefully massaging and kneading his leg from time to time. The moment he saw his grandson enter, he snorted angrily and confronted. Ah, you're finally back. Stefan greeted. Grandpa. Gracia wanted to speak when she saw him, but kept quiet in the end. Peter slammed the table with evident fury. Where did you go in the past two days? Do you still remember that you have a home to return to here? I'm busy. Busy? What were you busy with? Were you busy with a woman in bed? His grandfather furiously lambasted. She hastily tried to soothe his fury. Gently caressing his rapidly heaving chest, she meekly commented, Grandpa, don't be mad. You have to take care of yourself. He must be busy with work in the office. That's why... Is he really busy? Gracia, you're always looking out for him. But has he ever been thoughtful to you? Her face froze as her eyes brimmed with grievances. The atmosphere in the hall turned heavy and dark, hinting at the approach of a storm. Stefan sat on the couch, looking serene, as he brewed himself a cup of tea. He was apparently unaffected by his grandfather's display of fury. His attitude further infuriated Peter. That golf walk garden house you bought, who did you give it to? Peter asked gloomily as he looked at his grandson through narrowed eyes. 
Stefan frowned for a second. Obviously, his every move recently was being monitored. What he did a minute ago had swiftly reached his grandfather's ears. He was rather unhappy when he learned of this, so he did not respond to his grandfather's interrogation. Are you not going to speak up? Seeing his unresponsiveness, the old man straightened his back and then threw a folder in front of his grandson. At least explain this matter then. Stefan took out a stack of information sheets and a few photos from the folder and flipped through them without any expression. As expected, Grandmaster Lewis had sent his men to investigate Andres' identity. Gracia, who was standing at one side, curiously walked over to take a closer look. Her expression froze, and her heart plunged when she saw the photos. She did not know that Peter had checked on that little boy. She was completely ignorant of this. She was secretly fuming. Things had not gone according to her plan. If her grandpa found out about that boy, then that would lead to Monica. What if the investigation led to that matter that had happened over a decade ago? She stifled a breath at the thought, and her heart hung in the air for a second. Peter was too angry to notice the change in her, though, and he coldly continued amid his obliviousness. Have you checked thoroughly on this child yet? Stefan glanced up at Gracia, who was looking unsettled, and replied evenly, No. This child looks to be six or seven years old. How did that happen? The old man angrily retorted, I don't care how that child came about. In any case, Lewis's bloodline has to return to this family. Bring him back. She regained her composure and immediately said, Grandpa, we can put this matter aside for now. We haven't even determined this child's identity yet. It's quite a hasty conclusion, isn't it? Grandpa snorted. This child seems to have been cast in the same mold as Sam. This alone is sufficient evidence of the boy's kinship to our family. Identity can be fabricated, but not his DNA. Gracia felt terrified at his statement. Stefan kept his silence. Grandpa Lewis noticed his reticence and breathed out his rage. Give me an explanation for this. Hey, SAP. You called me back just for this. His brows creased. He was planning to bring in Andres to the Lewis family, but now was not that moment. He held concrete evidence in his hands, but this was not the time to reveal them. Of course not. Peter's wrath simmered, and he said in a suppressed voice, Quickly decide on your marriage with Gracia. Upon hearing that, a trace of delight crept across her face. Acting bashful, she said, Grandpa, why are you talking about this all of a sudden? Marriage? Stefan's eyes twitched precariously. What? If you don't decide now, how long do you plan to drag this out then? She's your fiancé and your childhood playmate. Now that you're both of age, your marriage naturally can't be delayed. Doing it at a later time will not put my mind at ease. Grandpa Lewis banged his walking stick against the floor as he grumbled in annoyance. She observed the young man's emotionless face, and her heart skipped a beat. Hugging her grandpa's shoulders, she pretended to be hesitant. Grandpa, we're not prepared yet. What do you need to prepare for a wedding? You both are already engaged for so long, yet you drag on your wedding ceremony. There will naturally be suspicions and murmurs circulating out there. Moreover, Gracia, it's not that Grandpa wants to nag at you. Even if Stefan hasn't set his heart on this, you should. Are you willing to let him be snatched away by another woman right before your eyes? Saying this, he scrutinized his grandson's face and said in a low voice, Gracia has been faithful to you for so long. Forbid you from letting her down. Hurry with the preparations for your wedding. Do you understand? Stefan went quiet for a while, and all of a sudden, his lips formed a profound curve. I understand, Grandpa. Good. His answer was like a dose of tranquilizer to Grandpa Lewis, and the latter's mind was finally put at ease. She was usually pleased as well. She thought that he would evade talking about this whichever way possible, 
she had not expected them to agree to it right away. Gracia, you two must be happy together. Grandpa Lewis was over the moon, and he patted the back of her hand with a benevolent appearance. She expressed reservedly, Thank you, Grandpa. Grandpa, I'm tired. I'll retire to my room. Stefan said vacuously and then went up the stairs. Grandpa Lewis then gave Gracie a signal through his eyes. The latter understood and promptly followed the man to his room while holding up her skirt. Once he entered his room, he removed his blazer unhurriedly. Seeing this, she volunteered in a saccharine voice, Stefan, let me help you. She hurried to help him change. The man eyed her detachedly from his peripheral view and shrugged off her help. She stood rooted to the ground, slightly perplexed at his aloofness. Stefan? She felt uneasy. Giving it another thought, she finally mustered her courage to speak. Recently, you seem to be treating me rather coldly. Why? He did not spare her a glance, and instead stared into the distance outside the window. Casually tugging at his tie to remove his blouse, he asked rather indifferently, Am I? Her heart clenched, and she answered with vexation, Of course you are. You're always unconcerned about me. Why is that so? Hasn't this always been the case? His casualness aggravated her discomfiture. She had no other choice, and it was impossible for her to back out as well. She had truly reached an impasse. Grandpa Lewis's voice echoed in her ears. If the man doesn't initiate, you as a woman should put down your reserve accordingly. Episode 160 Sleep with you tonight. Grandpa Lewis's voice echoed in her ears. If the man doesn't initiate, you as a woman should put down your reserve accordingly. Her pride was her reserve. She had once been reserved. Stefan was like a carefree, yet arrogant gust of wind with that temperament of his, though. In his presence, she was totally lost on how to start a talk and gain his interest. Since they were kids, he had always been distant toward her. On the one hand, he was surely opposed to this marriage and was probably totally uninterested in her. Her hands clenched into fists. She slowly stepped forward and questioned, Stefan, why don't you touch me at all? He slightly widened his eyes, which were cold and piercing, yet he did not spout a word. She observed him casually pulling off his necktie and removing his blouse before her. From his calm and lackluster expression, she could tell that he was acting as if she were invisible, just like the wind. The embarrassment Gracia felt was magnified. Noticing that he was about to enter the bathroom, she hurriedly took a nervous stride forward, and while forcing out a smile, continued her questioning. Is it because I don't attract you at all? Or is it that I'm not working hard enough? She paused for a while, and then she suddenly proceeded. If you want, I can take the initiative. He tilted his head impatiently. Bang! The sound of the bathroom door slamming shut was his reply to her. Click. The door was even locked. Her legs gave way, becoming limp, as if they were in a state of prostration. She swept through her hair in irritation. She was hurt too much and wanted to cry badly, but no tears would come flowing out. This man had always been this cold to everyone else. During his teens, he was never friendly to her. When she first entered the Lewis family and saw the man, the younger him gave off a throbbing coldness. He avoided anyone who wanted to get close to him. She admitted to this. For such a long time, she consoled herself with the fact that he never had any woman. However, toward that Monica, why? How good was she to actually move this man's cold heart? At the thought of this, the rage from within her heart intensified. No, I have to act fast. Since that lark was so useless, 
She needed to think of another way to remove that thorn at her side as quickly as possible. The door to the bathroom slid open. He stepped out in a cotton bathrobe. His long and lean figure, as well as his sexy and well-defined muscles, was exposed from the slightly open neckline. He seemed more poised and sumptuous now. His damp hair appeared to be a little disheveled, but it did not diminish his handsomeness. Rather, it accentuated his attractiveness. Seeing that she was still around, a trace of detest flashed past his eyes. Why are you still here? She mumbled, albeit cautiously. Grandpa told me to sleep in your room tonight. With me? The man questioned her emotionlessly. He casually lit a cigarette and drew in a deep breath. He seldom smoked, unless there was an important social event, or he was feeling extremely frustrated. She could tell that tonight he was not in a good mood. She, nonetheless, had a sudden bout of stubbornness and would not budge. Stefan, you're still probably not ready. I don't want it to happen this fast as well, but Grandpa's physical condition isn't very good, and I can only go according to his wishes. He insisted on me doing this. I don't wish to anger him, as I'm afraid that it will aggravate his condition. He squinted his winsome eyes in scrutiny of her. She actually brought out such a pompous reason. What a joke. Stefan, will you take me? Her long dress slipped off her body and fell to the ground in a heap as she inched her way to him. Her fair and smooth body became totally exposed in the cold, cold air. A veil of anger flashed across his face as the pupils in his eyes contracted. Stephen, I give myself to you tonight. Will you please want me? The woman walked up to him. Her arms slowly circled around the man's sturdy waist, and she gently placed her soft lips on his chest. She tried to melt his hardened heart with her sweet tenderness. As she was hoping for the man to make the next move, the man's frosty voice was heard over her head. Put them on. What? She looked up and stared into his penetrating orbs in surprise. Put your clothes on and get lost. It was still that frosty tone. Before she could react, he roughly grabbed her chin and told her with a look of disgust, Even if you want this, you have to see if I'm interested in what you offer first. My advice to you is, don't waste your time flirting with me. Don't you think you are cheap? Cheap? He asked in return. Why, isn't it so? Don't you find yourself repulsive? I... He pushed her away. If you want to seduce me, please use some real skill, or you'll only make me feel more disgusted. She fell heavily on the floor and squirmed in pain. Utterly embarrassed, humiliated, and despondent, her eyes moistened and turned red as she cried. What kind of woman do you like? I can change for you. Do you like the pure and innocent type, like Monica thinks? Is that so? If you have half of what she has, you probably won't be as distasteful as you are now. She was stunned, and tears overflowed from her eyes. The man could not be bothered to look at her. Finding her utterly revolting, he flipped her dress on her with his toe and told her off. Get lost! Footsteps sounded from outside the door all of a sudden. Without warning, Sam's tender voice was heard after a knock at the door. Daddy, can I come in? Seeing that the door was unlocked, the boy stood on tiptoe and pushed it open to the unbearable sight. She was down on the floor with a dress that barely covered her nude body. His father was standing at one side with a gloomy look on his face. Daddy! The child was startled, going red on the face, and quickly averted his eyes. I'm sorry. Come here. His father called out to him as he bent down slightly. Hearing his father's call for him, he covered his eyes and went straight to his arms. The man held the boy up as he covered his eyes with his broad palm. He threw a cold glance at her from his profile, telling her with it to get lost. She quickly wore her dress and fled in shame 
in anger. The door was closed again, and the room returned to its former peace. Sam pushed away his father's thick and broad palm, and then quizzically asked, Daddy, why wasn't Mommy wearing any clothes? She was feeling warm. The man placidly fit. It's cold and raining outside, the boy mumbled. His heart was still beating furiously from the earlier shock. Have you finished your homework? Ah, uh, I've completed it long ago, the boy smilingly replied as he hugged his father's neck. Daddy, can I sleep with you tonight? Yes. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget subscribe. See you on the next episodes.